Squeal like a pig. That's terrible. <laughs> oh, um, oh gosh, it's biscuits and mustard. Uh, it's the one uh, with um, deliverance. Two, deliverance. Yeah, I was not thinking of deliver, but that was deliverance. Yeah, I was thinking of one with um, Billy Bob Thornton. Oh yeah, he's like, you want some mustard on your biscuit? <laughs> I guess I had no reason to kill nobody. <laughs> I watch, um, I just watched, like, for the, probably the 30th time, No Country for Old Men. Oh, yeah, yeah that's uh, such an awesome movie. And, and it's so done by the book, too. Like, it's like, yeah. It's so, <laughs> flip the coin. That guy, he creeps me out. Now, I think about that role, every role he's in. He's yeah. in all these roles, and I think about that role with that he like, got Dutch, tight boy, yeah. Dutch boy haircut. It's like so... <coughs> So crazy, man. That it was great. I think that was his big debut, right? Yeah, I, I can't think of anything else that he's been in where I've been like, oh, that, yeah. The, th- the thing is interesting is about the, the, the whole, him using the cattle thing to blow out the, the the lock. That will not work. Really? No, you have a good jerk back. It's like physics. Because it doesn't just work. so much uh, tor- or uh, recoil. Yeah, it's you're you can't hold that stronger <laughs> than. Than what the door. Well, unless is. you're that dude, he was yeah, a freak he, of nature. He was. He was well, possibly. <laughs> possibly. <laughs> Probably the nerdiest right, thing. So you whatever comes about. up on the teleprompter, you have to read it. I have to read it. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you know who just moved into my neighborhood? Who? Sean Wheeler. Really? Yeah, he lived. So you've been in my neighborhood before. Yeah. We're on the left side. There's that neighborhood when you go in on the right side. Uh, called Rainier Village. Okay. Well, all the neighbors there refer to it as Eight Mile. <laughs> <laughs> Why is that? It's just the the houses there aren't priced as expensive as the houses on the left oh side. Oh my gosh, this is the so, bougiest thing I think I've ever. So they, right there. it's not my thing. <laughs> this is <laughs> first Eight time, Mile. First time. He's Bill arrived. Mazzino. Everyone. He's arrived. First time Bill Mazzino came into the neighborhood. He was like, "Is that where the peasants live over there?" <laughs> So Wheeler lives in Eight Mile. So you, got, you did you invite him over or I have yeah. Has he, he come over? No, he hasn't come. He's only been in the neighborhood like a couple of weeks. And I just saw it on the uh, Facebook page. He was asking people about um, uh, his hedges, whether he could take them down and put sod in. Oh, you have a HOA? Yeah. Oh, it's yeah. It's a Nazi oh, group of people. This they're the worst. I've been yeah. watching these things where people are like, coming into people's houses, like, like. Yeah, it's not that bad, but. Yeah, they, um, they're they're pretty they're bad. So lucky in Great Neck Meadows, like it's like probably the nicest neighborhood that doesn't have a HOA that exists in Virginia Beach. Yeah, we spend it's and people like are three hundred and eighty bucks a month. You got a clubhouse and a pool, but yeah, true. we have a pool, so we don't ever go to the yeah. pool. You ever use a clubhouse for like parties? I or think anything? we're going to use it for Amber's um shower, baby shower, oh. or Sarah's one of the two, whichever one has a baby first. I don't know. All of this. They're all they're all precious. I have a little. I have to say, I don't get jealous much in life, but your grandpa status, uh, I'm a little jealous of. I'm a little like I. Yeah. I would love to be you a just, grandfather, but it's way too soon for Reese. He's 13, so uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Speaking uh, eight mile, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. No, no wishes for that. No. Yeah. But Dave, uh, <coughs> little Dave's in uh, in college. That's wild. He's playing vars. He's on the varsity team for Super Smash Brothers for Shenandoah. What? He's getting paid. Is that the game? The gaming school? Like, yeah. is he going to school for gaming? He's going going to school for esports management. So, like, he wants to put on events. He's been putting on events all over the place. He did a couple at Wave. He's that's done, awesome. Um, he's done online events. That's his goal. Like, but he also loves to play, and he he's good. So he was like, he didn't think he made the team because. Well, in the tryouts, he only got to play twice. But he played their best guys and took them all the way to the end but didn't beat them. So he was kind of down on himself. And I'm like, yeah, but you played their best guys. 
What else do they need to know? They they could and, and so he was like really discouraged because he didn't get to warm up beforehand and he couldn't get the fast enough the Nintendo connection in his dorm wasn't working to play online play other people. He was really bummed out and then they called the next day. It's like, you congratulations, you've made the varsity. And wow. Yeah. I've beat yeah. little Dave before. No, I haven't. I'm you haven't. <laughs> That's no way. <laughs> he's crushed. He's crushed me every time we've played. He played. I remember Mario Kart. He. He beat Brandon Jesse when he was four years old at Mario Kart, and Brandon could not handle it because Brandon was like, I'm good at this. Like, he walked in like, oh, I'll play Mario. I'm good at this game. And <laughs> they beat him. It was That's awesome. how Moses was playing me on uh, It's the Super Smash Brothers, and they're, the characters are fighting each yeah, other. Yeah, that's, we, what, that's, that's okay. what David plays, yeah. Moses, I played him uh, this past Saturday. We're recording, by the way. Oh, we are. Oh, there we right. go. And uh, he, it's almost like he let me win the first two rounds. <laughs> and then he just annihilated me. How old is he? Seven. Yeah, and then he yeah. just crushes. Crushes me. Crushes, yeah. It just makes me feel old. But All right, hey, gang. Welcome to uh, KP's Black Box. Kenny Porter here. And today I have the honor, the privilege... And uh, I don't know, some other shitty words I'll make up here in a few minutes. <laughs> <laughs> um, today I'm interviewing uh, my ride or die high school buddy, mm-hmm. Mr. Dave Hummel, who I'm going to tell some stories today. Oh, We're going to wow. have a lot of fun with this. Um, wow. This dude, uh, music extraordinaire. So we're going to talk about your music career today, Dave. I, I didn't even give you a run sheet or tell you anything we were going to talk about today. I'm just hammering you with stuff. and Yeah. So we're going to really make his book open today and tell stories that um, you might have some interest in, or you may just 30 seconds into this just go, you guys are idiots. Or yeah. if, you, if, you, if you ever really wanted to know the real, real KP. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> I'm the interviewer. See, like, oh, okay. <laughs> um, this, this, this cuts both ways. Yeah, I, <laughs> yeah, I am aware. Um, but thanks for joining us. So we'll we'll get right into it. Dave, really is an honor to have you, man. It's uh, it's great to be able to sit here and reminisce with my shtick, man. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, this uh, is this is an awesome setup. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, I wish I could take credit for it. All I did was get out the checkbook. But there's guys like uh, Jake back there in the yeah. control room. Who, well, you you know you you produced him, so he produced this. So therefore, right. you produced it. Well, it was you know I I will have to say patting myself on the back. I did have a vision <laughs> for it. You know, I'm like I want the walls black. I want a acoustic wall here. That looks it looks great. So you know my queer eye for the straight guy. I guess uh, it looks know, awesome. my decor. Put it down. Thank you. But you have a lot of masculine tones, though. This is you know. yeah. Yeah, these okay. are a lot of masculine tones. So, and I'm trying to do the veteran wall to still be in touch with my vet community and gotcha. um, you know the jarheadness in me. Gotcha. Um, which is one of the first things. I'm, I don't know if you've even ever watched one of my podcasts. Yeah, have, I, have you? Yeah, yeah. So you know uh, this little ritual that we have in the very beginning is to uh, toast vets mm-hmm. um, and especially those gold, gold star family, mm-hmm. which yeah, that's my, my cl- brother in law was. Yeah, my brother-in-law was uh, killed in action in uh, the very end of 2005 in Iraq outside of Fallujah, yeah. uh, shot by a sniper. And, uh, yeah, it really changed the tra- trajectory of our lives. Your family's yeah. lives, yeah, yeah, for real. Yeah. And not not only that, but just even beyond that with your new brother-in-law now being mm-hmm. uh, now chief of operations of my firm but was Navy Special Warfare Yep, yep. Shout out to Shorty McShorty. Yeah, sh- Shorty the, is... The four S's, he's, he's got more, like, Shannon, Shorty... Short Ridge. Short Ridge, Stephen. Stephen, yes, he has a lot of S's. Yeah. I mean, it's, gr- it's great he doesn't have a lisp. A lisp, yeah. Yeah, that would be tough. <laughs> that would be hard for him. <laughs> um, but, yeah, dude, really excited to have you here today. And, yeah, in all seriousness, um, first thing we want to do is just... Uh, give a toast to those vets who have gone before us and have made the ultimate sacrifice, their families who have made the ultimate sacrifice. Um, so cheers to you and your family. 
Cheers. Oh, we got to put it on the head? Oh, oh yeah. I didn't know about that. Yeah. Is that a thing? And Jake gave us ice today. So That is really smooth. This is a whistle pig. That is, I'm not a whiskey guy, but this is It, it really, goes down easy, really, right? Really, good. Mm. And on ice is uh, nice, too. Yeah. And then we have our uh, KP and Co. Coors Light. Uh, not really. <laughs> it's just uh, mountain water from um, Middle Virginia. From, I can't see. Apparently, I'm not strong enough to open this. I gotta. Yeah, it's only for men. So. <laughs> there you go. Oh, you got it. Um, no showing skin either, Dave. Oh, ooh. careful there. Lift it up a little bit. Um, but yeah, this is actually Virginia water out. A little cavern, 400 feet below the earth, and they just yeah. use like one filtration process. And tasty water. It's good. Uh, it's kind of gritty. Like the logo. But, huh. Yeah, K- KP and Co. KP and Co. Um, Available here. Here. Yeah. 88 cents a bottle. <laughs> so I expect a buck on the table before yeah, you leave. No, no worries. <laughs> Can make it happen. I tried to I tried to pay in, in, in information. Yeah. Perfect. All right. We'll let you off the hook then. So um, what's going on in life, dude? Oh, man. Well, I just uh, dropped my son off to college. Yeah, we were just talking off camera about that he is yeah. e sports management yeah he's going to shenandoah university studying uh, it's a business degree focused on esports management but he just made the varsity team of super smash brothers and that's so crazy is. isn't that crazy that there is a degree program yeah for that now well it's it, i mean it's a multi-billion dollar industry yeah and, Which uh, you're part of, by the way we'll talk about yeah, that too. yeah yeah it's kind of my background with music and things like that but um yeah, it's it's cool, and I think about, um, and I don't mean this disparaging to any other sports, right? But I say like it's it's just as dumb as hitting a ball with a stick, right? <laughs> like, and I don't mean it's dumb. Yeah. I mean it's like, you know, you think back in the day when baseball started, and then people would get scholarships to college, yeah, to and play they're like, base- what? You're gonna to go to college ba- to, to play, play baseball? baseball? What? Right. And so it's just the future, and that's where we're living now. So yeah. it's really cool to what see. What do you think it would have been like for you and I? You know, we were um, high school athletes. I tried to be a college athlete. That was embarrassing. You were um, good, though. You were good. Yeah. I've, for Christian, a small, for Christian, small, small Christian school. It was small Christian with school. four yeah. other dudes. Yeah, we were stellar athletes. <laughs> yeah. No, you were a good yeah. athlete. Although we were pretty fast, man. We were, you know, kind yeah. of thunder and lightning of the day. Yeah, yeah. You were good at running over people. I was good yeah. at running away from them. I That's just right. happened to have the ball. <laughs> that was that was how that worked. Yeah, yeah. It, it, every uh-huh. once in a while, I got hit by a really big guy, and I was like, "Oh, I don't like this." There was the kid <laughs> at. Uh, now we're going to reminisce about high school. Here Sorry. we go. Here we go. Um, <laughs> there was a kid at Norfolk Catholic. I don't know if you remember him. And I think we were juniors, and big black kid who got a scholarship to UNC. Mm-hmm. Go Tar Heels. Mm-hmm. His name, remember Roman Small? Yeah, yeah. And he was not small. He was like three. All I remember is I was a fullback. You were halfback, yeah. running back, tailback, tailback. Mm-hmm. Um, I remember Scott Till, Brian Till. Brian Till mm-hmm. was our quarterback. Mm-hmm. Hands me the ball, and I'm like, "Why are you giving me the ball? <laughs> this mountain is right in front of me." And I just remember that thing being drove so far, so far up in my gut <laughs> that I thought I was going to spit out the football. And then he lands on top of me. And I'm like, you know, can't breathe. You're like, welcome to the NFL. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> That's how big they are. He was a massive dude. And that that was kind of a wake-up call. Like, okay, this is about bigger, stronger, faster. Yeah. Big and, guys that move that fast is a scary, yeah. like, this amount of force is unbelievable. And I, that's why I had no pursuit. I mean, I was good and was successful in high school, but I had no – I was a soccer player, and we went to a school didn't have a soccer team, so and I was fast, so that's I ended up playing football. So, Right. But nobody cares about that. No, nobody cares at all. <laughs> but my point, going back to that, and with your son, Little Dave, does he still go by Little Dave? Nah, just David. Little Dave. Yeah. That should be, like – his gamer name, like Little Dave. It's uh, Far Rumbus. Far Rumbus. Yeah. We'll, we'll have to come back and unwrap that. Yeah. But what do you think life would have been like for you and I had video games really been at the forefront? I mean, they 
I think the it the popularity of video games had started to wane at that point. Like when we were in high school, they weren't. Right. You know, there was Atari. It was that Atari happened. and ping pong. I mean, yeah, and Atari was big, and then it kind of died off when we got to high school, and then it picked up right. Actually, in the middle of our high school is when uh, Nintendo Super uh, the NES came out, but they had Mario Brothers. Yeah, but not a lot of people had it. And, and I, you and I were in a Bob computer Deacon, class together. Yes, basic and, computer class. Yeah, beginner's all-purpose symbolic instructional code. That's all I oh remember. Oh my gosh, a TRS eighty, TRS eighty, Radio Shack computer. Yeah, and we, I, I mean, Mrs. Basic, Jane, right? She was our, our I thought, teacher. I thought it was or Mr. Was it Mr. Banks. Banks. Mr. Mr. Banks. Banks it was. Yeah, Mr. Banks. Yeah, and it was good. It was very cool to learn what coding was, right? It's a very basic... I told people basic. I was a programmer back in high school. You programmed. I programmed. We all programmed. Yeah. We had like... <clears throat> I think it was like make a calculator or something like that. Run right? my initials across the screen in green. That's, it, that's it, all that's I... Really good. And that's, that's the only all color you had. That's yeah. the only color you had was green. Green. Yeah. Right. <laughs> it was an options. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, it's come a long ways. I mean, in a short period of time. I mean, even just... Oh, yeah. Go back now, 15 years, and gaming in the last 15 years has become an industry where universities are now recruiting kids, young men, young well, women like multi billion Ace. dollar business, bigger than movie industry by far. Yeah. By far. Like it's so insane. It envelops, I think, movie and TV gaming is bigger combined. Yeah, movie and TV come oh, on. Is, yeah, it is. Um, I mean these these games when they. I mean the you know Call of Duty, which is uh, I do work for. So those okay. I'll get into what I do slightly yeah. because it pertains to the conversation. So I do music uh, mainly for. Um, oh, there we go. Forty two million. Co- Call of Duty has sold over 425 million copies as of October 2023. 30, just that game, $30 billion. What blows me away <laughs> is 100 million active players, subscribers. Yeah. yeah. Monthly. Actually, I play with my sons. Jeez. Last night, we were killing zombies together. So my, uh, my son Cyrus is just down the road here, and then uh, son David is... At Shenandoah, but we were all killing zombies together last night. It was yeah. fun. It was good. Fun. Well, it was so and funny. so going back to even 15 years ago, and I want to start asking you questions about your profession, but 15 years ago, you wouldn't have even been able to play with your There was your no sons. online. There wasn't the internet. Yeah, the bandwidth of the internet. The internet was, was there, but it was people didn't have so access slow, to it. So slow, right. Yeah. They yeah. didn't have access to it. Like we yeah. were, I mean, they were... If you were in the military or universities, that was the only right. place that you could use the internet. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So go back to your career. And if, if I can, I'll embellish a little bit for you. Embellish away. Ba- ba- back in uh, 10th grade, mm-hmm. I tell this story all the time about you, that you pull into the parking lot. I think it was 10th grade. It may have been your junior no, year. No, it was 10th grade. Yeah. 10th grade. You know yeah. what I'm about to say. You pull in in a white MR2. No, actually, I did that. I had a red uh, 200 SX. I had the white MR2 later, though. I did get that. But later. in high school, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. I do remember the red car. Yeah. Um, and I'm like, Dave, what the f- are you doing? <laughs> hey, I'm, you know, I'm writing bumpers, and I'm like, <laughs> what the fuck's a bumper? <laughs> what, what do you? Do? Oh, I do things for CBN Mer- uh, Telephone. Yeah. I'm like, what? It's like, okay, what, what do I need to do? Huh? And you're like, kidding, no. <laughs> no, I, yeah, I was writing in high school. So I was, in high school, I was working professionally writing music for, um, I like General Motors. I did some projects for CBN, uh, was within our town here. Um, and uh, I did some stuff for the Family Channel as well. But I was still in high school, and it was all from cheating at piano lessons. <laughs> I was supposed to. I was. T- I took piano lessons since I was eight. I had to practice thirty minutes a day, but my mom didn't know what I was supposed to practice, so I would just make up stuff, and that's how I started writing. Yeah, and you then, had a you had a Korg keyboard. I, remember. I did. I had a Korg Poly eight hundred. Poly. That's that right. That was my first synth. And uh, Jake, pull up a picture of the Korg Poly eight hundred. Oh yeah, I, I I had a poster of this keyboard. Above, I was. Yeah. I shared a room with uh, my brother Andrew, and I was on the bottom bunk. And I put the poster, and every night I prayed for this keyboard. 
for Christmas. And uh, there it is. This thing was a brick. Yeah, it's uh, yeah. You could it actually had a guitar strap, so you could wear it and, yeah. and do it, and you could have it as a keytar as well. Um, but it was sort of like one of the first affordable uh, polyphonic synths. I, I thought when I first met you and your brother Andrew, I was like, dude, these are the coolest dudes. And oh, even, I even thought that about your brother Andrew, who was a complete dipshit. <laughs> that um, you. You 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 almost punched uh, re- out several times. Yeah, and, and does, he deserved. It. I remember uh, there was one year we were leaving the school, and me and your brother Andrew had just gotten in a little tiff, and I was pulling out of the parking lot, and I gunned my car like I was going to run over him. <laughs> and your dad comes walking across the parking lot and was like, "Kenny, w- w- what are you doing?" <laughs> and I was like, "I'm sorry, Mister. I'm always just <laughs> just messing with Andrew." But I got to give Andrew some props. That dude was a slayer on the drums. Oh, yeah. Unbelievable. Just a prodigy. Yeah. Yeah. The set that he had in your room over the garage, man, that thing was. Yeah, he he was. Freaking awesome. And, you know, if there's anything to clean from this, just the fact that he's had all this talent, but his people skills were terrible, (laughs) like the worst. (laughs) So he couldn't play in any bands. Like nobody would have him. He was such a jerk. Yeah. You know, it. Too you know, bad. I haven't seen him in a long time. He's been in and out of jail, so that's yeah, uh, that's unfortunate. Yeah. But yeah, I really did have a a soft spot, soft spot in my heart for Andrew. I I did. There was a part of him, and he was just a he was a fun guy, but he just couldn't yeah. let some of those demons go. And, yeah, he. Um, fun yeah. dude. He he chose. really was one of the best drummers. I mean, like I would put yeah. him on the level of a Neil Perts. Like, yeah, he could play all the rush seriously stuff. Seriously good. At in probably when he was like thirteen years old, he could yeah. play all of Rush, Master like of Puppets, yeah, you know, metal. I mean, he was just all that stuff. So fast, yeah. So, go, going back to your high school um, entrepreneurship, I mean, mm-hmm. that's really in my mind's eye where I saw it starting, where mm-hmm. I saw your career really like starting to really identify what you were going to be in the future. It's what I wanted. I always wanted to do. I got, I was very <clears> fortunate, <throat> very, very fortunate. I mean, my career has taken all this crazy serpentine path, but, um, working in music professionally is something I've always wanted to do. So I was doing it in high school professionally, uh, being paid, um, good money for a high schooler in the, you know, in the eighties. Dude, dude like, you were like uh, Zuckerberg. In those <laughs> like, like, it was making good money. Crazy money for yeah. a high schooler. And then uh, I got involved in some recording studios uh, out of high school and kind of developed my skills and then pivoted from uh, the commercial side of things to um, songs and producing songs. And I ended up um, working uh, uh, these two high school kids that were coming up, young producers, were heard my stuff and they were like, oh, we like the way it sounds. Can you help us record? I'm like, <laughs> absolutely, sure. And it's like extra beer money, literally. Like, it was just some extra money I could make to help record. And, you know, and, uh, you know, one of those young people was uh, Pharrell Williams. And which so, wild. which, like, in the early days of, um, and he was with Chad Hugo at the time, a group called the Neptunes, a producing mm-hmm. group. And they blew up. So here in Hampton Roads, Virginia, we were kind of the mecca of music producing at, at a time. Yeah. There's still a lot of t- tons of talent, but at that time, Teddy Riley, who ended up producing Michael Jackson, uh, moved into town. And then also you had um, Pharrell, who uh, who actually did the song Rum Shaker, <laughs> right? Put him on the map. And then... Um, but really didn't proper credit. Um, but then uh, also you had Timberland and Missy Elliott. Right. Happening all at the same time, all within yeah. a, a miles a, of each other. Yeah. And so... And at one point, across the street from each other. Yeah, 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 yeah. For instance, yeah, yeah. yeah, the studios, uh, Timberland ended up building a studio right across the street from, from Master Sound. And, uh, and so I was engineering... And so those who don't know, engineering is like the recording of the music, right? So a music producer will make the music or direct the people making the music. 
And then the engineer is the person in the studio who, you know, presses all the buttons, plugs in everything, and records the music. And it's a great job. There's people that that <clears throat> is what they want to do. Yeah. I just didn't. That was not my goal to become an engineer. Yeah. So Pharrell ended up. Um, I, t- I went to him finally as, as we're working. Do you ever on have any album. regrets of that with Pharrell? Where, you know, asking you to like be their guy full time, their engineer full time. Regrets? Yeah. Oh, not at all. That's awesome. Not at all. I got to witness, I got to be in the room for some really interesting conversations between like record companies and artists and producers. And I also got to see amazing, talented producers just do what they feel and not overthink. And that's the thing that's um, really important about trusting your gut. If you like it, do you in in Rick Rubin's books all about that? It's like yeah. do don't do music for an audience. Do music for yourself, and then uh, and if they and and if you like it, hopefully. But it, but if no one does like what you're doing, that's okay too. But yeah. if you're trying to make money out, that's of that's the art okay side too. of it. You you yeah. you just made something, yeah, on the artistic side, and it's such an expression that. You know, someone gets to decide whether or not they like something you created is is so subjective. Yeah, yeah. It which is. I guess is why popular music is pop music and what it is. And I mean, pop to me, the definition. Somebody said it once um, that pop music is just that more people like it than don't. Yeah. Right. Um, okay. Yeah, and and I actually teach a class. Uh, a, a college level class on songwriting in um, Professor Dave and uh, in, in we do a pop section right um, but pop is especially now is so ambiguous I mean in the past it was yeah. radio stations you know it was payola record companies would pay out radio stations to play artists and they would get popular that way and now we have the democratization of music because of the internet yeah. But what's really interesting is if you go in the pop, if you press pop hits on Apple or Spotify, it is music from all over. It is pink. It yeah. it it's going from early '60s to like Teddy Swims songs, like Just old Aretha. To Teddy Swims, yeah, yeah, like old Aretha sound, and then you have you know '80s sounds of things, and and um, uh, I think the only trend I'm seeing right now is like female vocalists are like doing this high breathy th- even people who have like big voices like ariana grande they're doing this high breathy voicey like mm. head voice thing that's maybe a trend but the music's all over the place you have post malone doing the country album which is incredible like incredible and i'm out of i like him fan. better in a country music setting yeah than i do in a pop setting and he's the sweetest guy oh look at here we have the uh yeah the, so billboard top yeah these the top 20 jay so these like breathy female vocal tracks, um, yeah. This is you have Post and Shibuzi doing their take on country, pretty much. Yeah, this is. Uh, you know what's crazy? Talking about engineers, uh-huh. um, our good friend Serb, who yep, will just not day. come on a show. I've begged him to Do come you have on the time? show. Oh, it's not about. <laughs> he, he, it's not about time. He doesn't want to. He doesn't like talking about himself. No, he hates it. <laughs> and I just, I want to get him on here and embarrass him, and right. But that's what I like I mean, about him. Like, yeah. so I love it. Like, so those are uh, our our friend Serban, uh, the most uh, award winning uh, uh, engineer mi- mixer. He mixes yeah. songs. So and then you know engineers will record everything, and then they send it somebody to mix. Serban's that guy who mixes. And he is, you name it, he's mixed it. And he's like the top guy. That list right there, probably 10 songs or something. Probably his, yeah. Yeah. Um, And, but he, but that's what I love about Servant is that he is not flashy. He's not about self promotion. Mm -hmm. He just, I got work to do. This is work. I I got work. (laughs) To the point of about 75 mixes a month is what he averages. That's insane. It's insane. I well, if, if, a funny story. So I called them. Um, so before Apple was doing spatial audio mixes, I was the the Atmos Dolby Atmos standard, where you like hear things flying around you with the headphones on and all this stuff. It had 
uh, Dolby had put it out and, and I'm like, man, should I, sh- I, I need to learn this. I don't know. And so I'm like, you know what? I'm going to call Serban up. I'm like, Hey, sir, um, are you doing anything? And at, uh, Dolby Atmos, he goes for the last year, we've done nothing, nothing but Dolby Atmos makes this. And I was like, Oh, oh my gosh, I'm behind. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm like, can you show me? And so I had, he had co over and John showed me the setup and, yeah. and, um, yeah, and and so when when Apple debuted Dolby Atmos, pretty much ninety percent of the mixes were Serban's mixes showing off wow. Dolby Atmos. That's wild. Yeah, yeah. I th- I was talking to Alex, his son, who's now in and of himself is an amazing, and he's actually doing more on the production, but some mixing, um, and is a, a great uh, professional in the business. But we were just talking last week, and I was like, Alex, I just read where Serban uh, is like number three in all Grammy winners, all wow. time. He's won so many Grammys that he's in the top. I think it's, the, it's either the top three or top five. Wow. I mean, he's not going to beat Max Martin. Who's, who, who's up there, right? Max Martin, who if you, and anyone who doesn't know who Max Martin is, Max Martin is the guy who he literally yeah. wrote every co-wrote almost every pop song you've ever heard of since the nineties. Yeah, I mean Katy yeah. Perry being like yeah, Katy Perry, top. Britney Spears, In yep. Sync, but but The Weeknd, like yep. he he um, Kelly Clarkson. I mean, there's a there's a YouTube video out there that just it's 22 minutes. Of Jacob, you don't have to look it up. It's 22 minutes of showing Max Martin songs, and then charting, and then, and then, of of each song charting up the charts. But it's 22 minutes long of years. It's just going through years, Jeez. and and it takes 22 minutes. It takes 22 minutes to show. Yeah, there he is. He's number 15 on the all-time list. Is that what it? That's far from. I read something that was uh, he was much higher than that. I mean, but I think a, he's at is that's that twenty crazy names on twenty one. This is how Siri should work. Yeah, like this is how AI should work, right? We're having a conversation, and then that pops up. Yeah, fact check me. Boom, there Jacob, you can you be AI? Yeah. <laughs> yeah instead of uh, I'm better than. Yeah. If you instead are of, better than for sure. Instead of saying hey Siri, I just go hey Jake. <laughs> And he hates that I call him Jake. I'm the only one who calls him Jake. Everybody's like, and I Jake. think you probably call him that because he hates it. Yeah, Dude. probably subconsciously. It just, <laughs> yeah. Well, it's better than bacon bits, right? Yeah. Oh, there we go. Okay, that's Isaiah's nickname for him that would send Jacob into rage. <sighs> when I, I had, it was funny when I came in. I hugged. I I I I said hi to Jacob. That's how AI works, right? And then, what are you doing? Uh, oh my god. You can't put Marxists up on the. Uh, uh, oh, hey, there we go. Wait, let's not. Let's, <laughs> let's not. I, let's not go I knew here. I would get Dave with that. Let's I not go here. Marxists. Oh my gosh. Oh, Listen, I know real Marxists. Okay, if you want to talk yeah. about Marxists, I got. I got some friends who you Marxists. Guess, you, all right. Well, that, there's uh, cousins yeah, right they there. Not, they those Marxists don't like them. <laughs> That's yeah. next pod. That's what next pod. Okay. <laughs> That's our. Okay. Don't get me started. We're, yeah. <laughs> So I, I will say this to you. I, I have to give props to you. Um, you know, going back to shout out to Pharrell, <coughs> Pharrell and Chad. That years ago when you started working with those guys at Master Sounds, um, I remember one day you called me, and you know I was a rookie in the financial business, and you're like, "Hey, Kenny, you need to come over to the studio." Mm-hmm. And I, I had a couple of meetings lined up in my office just down the street here. I'm like, Dave, I, I don't know, man. I, can't, I don't know if I can make it over today or not. And you're like, seriously, you need to come over. There's a couple of guys here with six-figure checks in their hands, and they don't know what to do with them. Mm-hmm. And you introduced me to Pharrell and Chad, and I helped them you know, with their tax stuff and you know, my financial business. But that, that one move, that one referral, and I – I'll actually talk about that this weekend at one of my – I've got a um, speech i got to do at a national financial conference, and I'll be bragging on you there. Mm. Um, 
that it just goes back to those relationships that you have in life. You know, you, you and I were, you were doing much better than me financially than where I was at that time, just starting a career. And it was brutal in the financial business starting now. Um, yeah, but you were you were doing everything you could, and I and yeah. I think it was a year and a half. Like we met, and you had been doing it for a year and a half, and uh, I just was watching what you were doing because mm-hmm. uh, you know it was new to you, and I was like, is he good at this or not? I don't yeah. know. And, and it was like, oh, he's got it. It seems to be doing well. And then I saw a check for one hundred eighty thousand dollars sit on a coffee table for three days, <laughs> and I just thought about the interest that yeah. is like that sitting there. Is lo- and, yeah. and I was like, oh, they they don't know what to do, and uh, and and who does? Right, like, you know. I mean, we're talking. We were all twenty early, somethings. Yeah. yeah, you know, twenty somethings, um, and having that much, and that's where like high schools do you no service on teaching you financial yeah. responsibilities or anything like that. So people they teach you exactly how to work right. in factories, or they teach you how to work for right. you know that it they don't teach. They're doing better now. They, yeah. uh, my son was taking some classes of some financial uh, economics, but like personal economics classes, which I yeah. thought would oh, about time, you know. Yeah. And people. yeah, teaching consumer math that was you know in high school that was one of the best classes for me. It was mm. consumer math? It wasn't algebra or trig. It was really getting down to what caught my attention was future value of money, mm. present value of money, interest rates, and I'm like, oh, I can I can dig this, but. Okay. In that um, conversation, whatever conversation you had with Chad and Pharrell that day, mm-hmm. and then I go over to the studio and meet the guys, mm-hmm. um, that led into a you know, lifetime uh, meaningful opportunity. And Pharrell was such a kind person. Yeah. He would just, you know, if he believed in you, he would refer you. And Chad, too. Yeah, yeah. Would refer you to anybody. And that's how I met Serban and... Yeah. You know, can all of our friends in the music business. And you were doing a great job for him and and yeah. and, and and introducing him to uh like a whole financial world um investments and, and all that that they wouldn't have been privy to in yeah. the music side of things until you know <laughs> until Pharrell met everyone, including uh now he's the creative director for uh, what Louis Vuitton? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I mean, he's in the stratosphere. He's a, he's on he's on level of fame. Like when grandmas know who you are, that's yeah. that's yeah. When grandmas are singing your songs, yeah, yeah. When grandmas know, yeah. you know, little ladies know who you are. That's and 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 it, and you're well, just Pharrell. That's right. it. That's right. it. <laughs> Which is so cool to see. Yeah. I mean, that it, it also was very eye opening. So you know, I moved. So going back to the history, I'm engineering for for Pharrell and the Neptunes, and then I said, "Hey, listen, I really produce. You know, I produce, and I'm not doing what I love." And he was like, "I completely understand." Let me make a couple phone calls, and get introduced you to some people. I mean, he kicked off. Uh, he called Zamba, which was the big pop pr- production place at the time, um, and I was talking to them. And then I moved out to LA, and then end up signing to Sony Music Publishing, yep. and. But he um, he kickstarted that. But watching somebody go from, you know, not, he wasn't ever rags, but I mean, it was you know from the bottom to the top, and then also just watching him trust his gut, and it it opened my eyes. And so you moved to L.A. I moved to L.A. and it was funny because people were like, you know, this is L.A. And I'm like, listen, everybody who's big here is from somewhere else. Right. So I don't pretend this place yeah. is magical, right? Right. And uh, and because I had been in those rooms and worked on those sessions, it, came, it gave me a, a good perspective to see, okay, how do we do this? Now, unfortunately, this is the early, this is 2001, I signed my publishing deal and with Sony and... Napster ha- becomes a thing. Oh my god! <laughs> and overnight, yeah. music becomes free. So imagine you work in an industry where you're making, you know, this right, and yeah. then all of a sudden, and you're selling a ton of this. And at who the, was the Napster guy? Oh gosh, not Fred, not Fred Dirt. Um, Jake, you got to look it up. Yeah, um, he ended up investing in a couple of the things yeah. that were big too. But you're right. I mean, too. that crushed. 
the for business sure. for a while. And for I remember sure. guys like an uh, old buddy of mine, Jeff Jukes. <clears throat> he, and this is when the uh, Apple iPod first came out. He was downloading music onto our corporate servers. Oh, I remember that. You I remember, remember? I remember Jay that. Jay Matthews. And and, oh, yeah. You had, every, you had all Sean this Sean Parker. Yeah. Yeah. They shut down our network downloading yeah. songs, and it, it crushed it for like three days, and the IT guy was so pissed off. I, I remember the music industry being really paranoid about <laughs> recordable CDs, yeah. and they were all looking in this direction, and like, re- like recording, duplicating a CD like one at a time, that's what, or maybe you had a tower of like, you could do six at a time, <laughs> right? Think about that. They were worried about that, yeah. and then Napster, just all the songs all at once, anybody could have access to it and um it brilliant technology like yeah. brilliant uh brilliant technology but it de- decimated the, the music industry and i was working with artists that their label was imploding like we're in the studio racking up bills and i can't get a hold of the main office and then i'm finding out that they're going <laughs> under Right, that was it. Was scary. The well, it dried up. Yeah, so I was in this music side of things. So I, then I was like, okay, pivot back to commercial music. Right, so yeah. I had a, but I ended up have working. Uh, I ended up working at. Uh, so t- tell us, tell us about so Tascam. Yeah, that's a pretty cool story, but I want to jump to the um, American Idol Underground. That's that's later though. I'll get to that. Okay. I'll get I'll get to that. So, so task cam then. Okay. So so I have a pu- music uh, how music publishing works is they advance you money, and then you have to have a certain amount of songs in stores <laughs> for sale, right? It, you you have to and they and then they will you get you more some money. CDs. Well, you have to have you have to be writers on songs. So let's say you co-write a song with somebody. That means you have fifty percent writers, right? And let's say you have a obligation of having like five songs, but you're co-writing everything. So that means you have ten, ten. Ten, 10 songs in the store that you're at least fifty okay. percent uh, writer on. Well, m- now music stores are going out of business <laughs> because music's free, right? So, so you still have a publishing deal. Like they still for seven years. Like you're you're writing songs, but they don't give you any more money, so you have to go out and get a regular job. So I ended up working for Tascam because it was somewhat in the music industry. Well, side story because it implies your. I don't know if I've ever told you this story before. Okay, so a buddy of mine says, "Hey, there's this guy. He's to, his financial services, like mortgages and stuff like that. He's gonna be. He's coming in in town. He's meeting. He hired a friend of mine. My friend's like making thirty k a month." And he's hiring more people. In 2001, that's a big money. Yeah, this is yeah. like maybe, this is like 2003 or four. Okay. So I go in this meeting to meet this guy. This guy comes in. And he starts talking about how much money you can make. And it was basically doing loans, like, you know, mortgage services. And he's like, you know, he, and, he, and, he, and, he, and you might trigger this part. He goes like, some of you in this thing, this isn't for me. And and years from now, you're going to be pulling up in your broke car, <laughs> and the guy next to you will be pulling up with his hot girlfriend and a brand-new Mercedes. Now, if this doesn't, this whole speech sounds familiar to you, it's because it's the Wolf of Wall Street. Oh, Jordan. <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> Jordan. Jordan, Jordan was. Yes, the Wolf of Wall Belfort. Street. Yeah, Belfort. <laughs> yeah. So I'm in, now what's funny is he was talking about how, like, you know, some of you may have seen that I turned state's evidence, and I'm like, what? So I didn't even know who this guy was, right? I just knew he was the devil. And and if he hears this, you know you are. (laughs) He had the slick back here, the whole thing. I mean, the flipping devil. It was amazing. I literally went back. To to my wife Sarah, it said, "I think I met the devil today." <laughs> <laughs> Jordan, Belfort. yeah, yeah. So so um, then he he's uh, reformed, by the way. He's he's reformed now. Okay, he was reformed then. <laughs> apparently, um, I, I don't know. I don't know. Anyway, so uh, so I'm like, well, I know friends of mine really make do well in this industry. So I might not like this guy, but I don't know what to do. Da da da. And so I called my dad, and he hit great advice. He goes, well, what do you want to do for a living? I said, I want to do music. Okay. He goes, well, which one of these jobs can you just forget about at five? 
at 5 p.m. and then work on music. And I was like, well, the job at Tascam, because I was up for that as I was having this interview. And he goes, well, that answers the question. So my buddy ends up working for Jordan Belfort. Mm. Works his butt off, gets all these loans in the works. You know, he's like 60, 90, almost 90 days to thing. He's got a bunch of money coming in. Shows up to the office, cords hanging from the ceiling. All the stuff gone. is gone, flipping, pecked up, and jetted, right? That These are all facts. This really happened. So if anybody wants to think it really happened to my friend, Ed, and I was like, I felt bad for my friend, but I'm like, oh, I definitely you dodged made. a bullet. I dodged a bullet. And he took in, in the contracts that they all signed, really, they had zero claim. It was all under his, the auspices of his stuff. So, yeah. I, I'm, I'm kind of like the, the, um, the Forrest Gump of the music business. <laughs> <laughs> run into these random Run, Dave, run. <laughs> run into these random people. So, okay. So I'm working at a task cam. Um, I am doing, uh, it, it's very much like The Office. Like the, you know, I, I it, it's. Are you Dwight? Uh, no, I'm not. We, de- Jim? we definitely had a Dwight. Strangely enough, literally worked with the guy who, you know, the comic book guy from The Simpsons? Yeah. Was modeled off of him, literally. No way. Yes, this guy named Jackson. He was literally the Only the Los pony Angeles. ponytail. Yeah. Well, he. Well, I knew it was true because I said something to because somebody said, "Hey, talking about the comic book guy," and, and I asked him about it, and he got really, really mad, and then starts <laughs> telling me a story how he got into an argument with the creature of The Simpsons about Star Wars or sci-fi and science fiction and. and <laughs> Yeah, look, yeah, look, look <laughs> wore, wore a blue shirt. It like, I mean, exactly like him. It had had a had a goatee. Like, it, I mean, I was like, oh my gosh, this is him completely. What do you know the guy's real name? The the, the comic it, book guy, like your your friend that was modeled. Oh, Jackson. Out. We call, just call him Jackson. I don't know his last. It was first name or I last name. I just wondered if we could find him on the internet. I, th- I think he passed. Yeah, he passed. <laughs> oh, oh that yeah, sucks. He passed. He passed. Yeah. Of course, I would ask him. <laughs> Um, yeah, it was a while ago. I mean, this yeah. is 20 years ago, and he was not healthy. Um, so, anyways, so I'm at task, I'm at task cam doing, uh, uh, just trying to do the best job I could and still working on music. So I pivoted back to working on trying to get back into do commercial music and things for TV and all that. So a guy, a friend of mine at church, uh, was starting his own uh, motion graphics company. But before that... Matt Tascam, building relationships with also with other companies that go to trade shows. And then uh, another friend from church was starting. He had purchased the license for American Idol, a website for, called American Idol Underground. And he needed somebody who knew the music side of things. And my experience with being a part of music but also having access to companies – uh, that we could, you know, call up for prizes and stuff like that. Yeah. They hired me on as vice, vice president of business development at uh, American uh, American Idol Underground. Fluid Audio Networks was the the company parent company, which was the parent company also of American Idol at the time, right? No, no, or Fremantle. that was Fremantle. Fremantle, Fremantle. Fremantle. and still yeah. is Fremantle. Yeah. Um, and so Fremantle, Fremantle Media had a little bit of uh, seller's remorse because the internet wasn't as up as it was, and they had sold this license, and so we were running with it. We're like, you got this big brand, so we're throwing Hollywood parties, and 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 that's who you came out. Came from. out, you yeah. Came out to a Hollywood. We thought party. we were rock stars. We, I, we thought we were too. <laughs> <laughs> it was uh, an LA. Jake, pull, a funny time. pull this up. Um, what year was that? The American Idol Underground oh, like gosh. street party. Um, two thousand five. Yeah, that feels right. That feels right. Two thousand five or two thousand four. Well, I think two thousand five. And who was the big black dude that was uh, helping? Um, gosh, I blank. You are. Him. You're. I'm blanking. Oh, Bennett. Um, ben, um, God, we probably no, I'm gonna see. This it. is why we need pre-production. We should. We do. Talk yes, to him, but. but it's fine. <laughs> no, he's a great guy. He hired me out, and he's also done things. He had a banking. Uh, he had a banking background. Um, but it was legit, man. I got to give you guys props. I don't think you were wrong. I just think you were early. Well, this is where it wasn't even early. It was that 
and smart to Fox Television when they their contract said they had the exclusive right to give away a record deal. Mm. So we could give away anything but a record deal. And at the time, it was the only thing that people actually wanted. wanted. Yeah. They wanted a record deal. Right. Now, Jake, can, can you find anything on American Idol Underground? There's nothing out there. I don't even know. It was probably on the uh, Wayback no, Machine. Can't, I can't find any, or I haven't found anything yet. Yeah. Really? Yeah. I mean, you closed down. Um, I mean, there was by two thousand six or seven. It was. It got. It got rolled into another company, and then um, tried to had to pivot because it just couldn't generate the eyeballs because it couldn't give away a record uh, a, uh, yeah. a record deal, which was unfortunate. It's out there, Dave. I, I mean, uh, Jake. Just yeah, American under American Idol, Idol underground underground. Yeah, but they they Los may Angeles. have scrubbed it though. They may have scrubbed it because you think? well, pro- possibly, possibly. I mean, you know, it become they they ended up having their own such a big web presence on the show that I would say they probably bought it's up the domain for whatever buried cost so and, deeply. Yeah, in but the bowels of Google. It was it was fun to do. So I was doing that and. Uh, and then also doing pivoting back to commercial music, um, doing stuff for TV show openers and stuff like yeah. that. So, um, well, that street party you guys that Jay and I came out to, I mean, you had some really good bands. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And there was some pretty amazing talent. Uh, and obviously in Los Angeles, you're going to find the cream of the crop of. Yeah, and we paid, I mean, you pay people. I mean, it's. It, LA is an interesting town because it, if you have got money to spend, you can look how yeah, somebody was, will spend it. Yeah. yeah, I mean, there's a guy who rents his house out by the hour to influencers to look like they live there, yeah. and, and you know, it's <laughs> you put us up in a uh, in a hotel in Los Angeles called the Standard. Yes, and I mean, <laughs> I walk into this hotel and there's girls in. The um, behind the hotel lobby check-in desk, there's girls in little nighties with a a whole scene. Do you remember first, the bed? First of all, this sounds little, like I, I booked you to a brothel. Yeah, was not, I mean, pretty much just, that's what I thought. It was not. It's right on Hollywood. It's a very famous it's hotel. Like Dave is I had no idea. I had no idea. No idea that um, that that was there. It's just you know in L.A. You know the whole the woman laying down and sushi's on her, right? Like, like they're all into anything yeah. to make I people look like I think we found like some property. pictures of you, Dave, back then. <laughs> at the standard. This is literally the only thing I can find is these photos. Oh, yeah, I look at that. I don't even know if... <laughs> I don't even know who these people I are. I also saw this uh, website, I think, right legal stuff. here. No, not that one, sorry. Uh, this one. Like we a, were something. Some old website. Yeah. For it. Yeah. There's the 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 fluid audio page. networks. Yeah. Yep. There you go. Here we go. Fremantle even made it on there. I want to say. But if you go to Idle Underground on that hyperlink, where does that take you? A domain that's for sale. <laughs> 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 Welcome to the web. By the way, everyone, uh, this is how a conversation with two people who may be uh, ADHD yeah. it goes. <laughs> Completely. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Jacobs, I know he's laughing back there. Kathleen like... would concur. <laughs> sure. Can you stay on one topic? Just finish a conversation. I always wonder, do, do <clears throat> squirrels go human? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. Human. Let's talk about that. <laughs> Okay, we're done with that. Let's move on. Um, okay, so so f- I'm American Idol Underground goes underground well, so deep that well, first I move here. My brother in law gets killed in action, and so he left a wife of like twenty one and two kids, mm. and uh, we came back and um, to help take care of family. Mm-hmm. So I was still working for American Idol Underground when I moved back. From uh, to Virginia, Hampton Roads area, and I never want to leave LA. But we felt that God, this is what God wanted us to yeah. do, and help take care of family. And so, uh, yeah, started doing that. And as that went on, my 
friends at church that were doing motion graphics, their company started doing better and better. So I was doing stuff for Cartoon Network and um, uh, Breaking Amish. Like I did, the, <laughs> I, I did the I did the theme for that show, like random shows, um, and so did a lot of TV theme work and uh, network branding stuff. I had completely forgot about that show until the other day. I saw an Instagram post a video of this Amish girl coming home with her new baby, oh. and he was he was black, and so she had to introduce her boyfriend to the family. And how'd that go? It was uh, like a turd in a punch bowl. Um, it was just... <laughs> <laughs> Kenny, <laughs> I don't even know what to say to that. Um, okay, <laughs> moving yeah. on. Yeah, it moving was on. It was not good. It was not good. <laughs> I don't even know how to respond to that one. Um, but, yeah, and Breaking Amish did a uh, bunch of TV stuff, uh, NF, uh, NFL. You did the, the music on that? Yeah, did the opener uh, what, the music? What kind of Amish man? What do you play? Well, what do you play on Well, this that? is funny because uh, Amish actually don't believe in music, like having music, right? Yeah. So I had this whole crazy pitch in my mind of like, okay, so if I live in a culture that doesn't like believe in, in music and singing and stuff like that, well, well, then what? What can we do? And so I created this music style of like humming and stomping. So like it was their workaround, right? Their workaround on music, and and I pitched the idea, and the network was like, "That's too weird." <laughs> <laughs> so I ended up using what people would assume would be like dulcimers, you know, very earthy sounding yeah. music, very like uh, folksy bluegrass, like not even bluegrass, more like folk music yeah. that people would assume Amish music would sound like, but it's not. So, do you remember when you moved back? Um, we were we had a little business that me and my partners and you had launched called Just Toss It. Just sell just it. Just sell it. No, just sell it. Not <laughs> <laughs> just. Toss it. There was Speaking a Just Toss It. Should we be a website? Yeah, it was a Just, just sell, sell It, it. it was the eBay consignment store. You had been seeing these eBay consignment stores yeah. and you and you were jazzed about it and I was like this this, this looks see good what happens. and see what happens and um but we should... we ended up you hooked us up with an auction at Future Studio yes and, oh yeah and we go to Teddy Riley yeah, Teddy Riley who produced Michael Jackson right. his old so studio so bringing it back to music yeah yeah we go over there for a uh, city auction and damn if we didn't have Teddy's Grammy for Michael Jackson's. Uh, do you remember this? Yeah, but that that didn't come from that. that we, somebody came in with it. They had but they had bought a storage unit. A storage, storage unit. unit. I, I, they had purchased a storage. But we unit. also had the master. Yes. To a um, bunch of Michael Jackson stuff. Michael Jackson songs and yeah. our dumbasses. So dumb. Did we sell it or did we just pass on it? I think we we consulted a lawyer. And they were saying that this is is still property, property right? The, because when it'll you get always music be law, Michael's masters. Right? Yeah, yeah. It's is even if you owned it's like you owned the plastic and you owned yeah. the magnetic tape, and this was on uh, digital audio tape, right? You you own that, but yeah. you don't own what's recorded on it, and so it, w- it was definitely becoming a legal thing. We but had to, we sold the Grammy. No, we didn't. Uh, yeah, we did. We did. We sold it, and then remember the AMA came back and sued us. Oh my God! Uh, would they threaten us? They, they were threatened. like, "Get the Grammy back! It's yeah. not yours! It's not yours to sell!" Yeah, yeah. And we had all that legal crap. We had to go back to the dude, give him his money back. Oh my God! You remember that? No, I, I mean, I'm now you're, it's coming back to me, but maybe and it I was like ten thousand bucks. <laughs> it was scary. I'm yeah. like, oh my god, we're we're about to get just murdered by this the, is for the dark web where you probably could sell yeah. all of that stuff. <laughs> So we sold a freaking Grammy online. <laughs> and Servant was trying to, he goes, you guys are effing nuts. What are you doing? You can't sell that. It's not you. I'm like, the hell we can't. I'm like, I don't know the rules, but we're, somebody's, somebody bit like 10,000 bucks for that thing. Yeah, I mean, think and about And so it. we had a 35% VIG on that, right? Yeah. Yeah. That what it, yeah, around there. So yeah. anyways, this, the story behind that is that you were doing whatever it took to support your family. Oh, yeah. And just make... Ends meet until you got things 
back in order. I mean, because the rug was pulled out from under you in California. Well, especially in 2008, really. I, I mean, and the housing in, in crisis. Yeah, the global financial crisis. Just so like in and the, in the range scare in your family with with Sarah, which was scary. Well, Sarah had cancer when we were in L.A. Yeah. So when I was dealing with all the music business stuff there, right, she had Hodgkin's disease, and so um, and fully this, in remission now. Which yeah, is fully awesome. in rem, yeah, fully in remission. But it was a stressful time. But um, <coughs> yeah, coming back and uh, I mean, I was doing whatever it took, and I ended up. Uh, taking a job doing sound, uh, head of the sound department at a church, yeah, um, and uh, and then kind of rose up the ranks. It's funny because I'm a musician, I play keys, but they needed help in sound, so I ended up going through sound and produ- and became head of production, and then became creative director eventually. And I was doing so great season. I mean, that was a great, and that was great exposure to to. <laughs> Where kind of mega churches were going at the time. Yeah, yeah, definitely a mega church, definitely. Um, and 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 I, I made uh, how do I phrase this? I made uh, very shiny, beautiful Jesus buttons that no one needs. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's great. I'm yeah. very thankful for the opportunity. We did some huge productions and stuff like that. But in you know, I'm a person of faith and and and. Uh, a Christian but that's the following. culture of Christianity, not necessarily the worship. I, I think there's a big difference between the two. That it was great for entertainment for Christians. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but I don't, it, I don't know that necessarily it was um, resource wise. It's expensive to do things yeah. like that, and so you know that's where that's where there's a great dialogue about what is you know how much you take care of the poor, how much do you. Entertain your lay people. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is that's a bigger discussion than we have time. We for can here. we can talk about that and uh, <laughs> Kamala and Trump if you want. Yeah, let's let's oh just gosh, go. Let's not. pull up all the dirties of yeah. the, the, the dirties. I, I miss. I would have. Yeah, I miss in a place now. Is it, it, uh, very thankful for those opportunities to put on those great productions, and we did some amazing things. The, the the downside is there was a lot of volunteers that worked very very hard that I, I I'm very gifted in herding cats yeah. and so I'm I'm good at wrangling a lot of people in a production and stuff like that but I look and back, wrangling people who have a little bit of a personality too if we want oh to yeah say creative that. people yeah. yeah and and communicating with creative people I live in I'm a creative person but I'm also like highly logistical so I live in this weird paradigm. Mm-hmm. Um, you're just weird, Dave. I am weird, um, and it's okay. Yeah. I love me. I love you, Dave. Oh. And uh, the I love you too, Kenny. That's the whistle pig. This is the whistle whistling pig. at you. That's it. Oh, you're ahead of me. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that. So I got a lot actually experience in live music production. Um, you know, projector mapping and how lights intersect, and and so. Um, actually working on something right now. Mentored show. my son, which is a lot of why the studio is what it is today. Is I would say paying homage back to Hummelstein. I would, um, I would, yeah, I would say this. I mean, I did. I had part of that, but a great guy there. Uh, um, so that church, uh, Steve Tigner, who is incredible. Yeah, Steve. And awesome. most of my success was due to Steve Tigner because he was such a great recruiter of people. And um, I would literally say Steve impossible. Steve Tigner, aka. Jack Black. He looks kind of looks like Jack Black. Not kind. He is. I got a he, picture on my phone <laughs> when you did the L.A. launch right. for the church out there. Yeah, yeah. And he's in the Nacho Libre. Libre thing. He looks just oh, like. Oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> well, he is insanely capable. I would, I would make up things that have never been done, and then said say to him, like they had been done before, and he would do them. <laughs> And then I would show up and go, "Oh my gosh, I, we he really did it!" Like, like he was he's that guy. I mean, probably the most talented, resourceful um, guy I know. And so he also was mentored uh, Jacob in a big way. And and so I got to give props or props yeah, props is due. I'm I'm. Uh, yeah, J- Jacob being your being your son and and, um, and, and I, it, it was always a uh, 
interesting relationship because I kind of represent you in a sense, you know, and so, you know, fathers and sons and yeah. stuff like that. He's like, you know, he would be doing something like, he couldn't get I, away from me. I don't, I know how to, I know how to do this. If you just ask me, <laughs> but he'd work through it, but he also, he always got it done though. He yeah. always figured it out. It would just took half, the, maybe less than half the time if he would ask. I mean, I watched him. Jake literally rip his house apart and put it back together himself. I mean, no, the he's, talent that kid has is. I've hired him to do things that blows me away. That I can't do, and he can do, and yeah, and, and, yeah, amazing. Jake, J- Jacob, Jacob, <laughs> you almost have me calling him. Call <laughs> J- Jacob, we love Jacques, you, Jacques Cousteau. Love, um, love you, Dave. <laughs> so, you know, present day, Dave, mm-hmm. your music prowess, your expertise has really been honed into NFL. Gaming, um, wh- yeah. Well, else? so what? all my so all my TV clients started pivoting into motion graphics for the video game industry. So I'm in a really weird niche where I do music for Nintendo. So Nintendo Direct, if whenever they're announcing everything, I I do the music. Um, can we can we see some of that stuff? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you can go to my website, uh, DaveHumbleMusic.com. So uh, Microsoft, uh, I do. So Nintendo Direct, um, Halo, uh, Halo series when they had an announcement. So here we go. So what we hear is what yeah. You produce. All the so sound they, design. So they all that send stuff. you a video file. Yeah. And you just see these graphics moving, and you've got to come up with with the music. What what that should sound like. Yeah, so I do also do sound design. So, like, for every time they have a new Call of Duty, they have a next event as well. So breaking when this, Amish. No, this, this breaking is, Amish. Is this yeah, the, this is the break. Is this, this the turd in the punch bowl? This scene? is No, I love this thing, actually. <laughs> I love this one. I guess I just need to get away and find out who I really am. For once in my life, I'm going to do something for me. You grew up the shelter. Like, I want to experience everything. I'm going to have to go watch this show. You want to do your dreams. I can't stand the thought of living the rest of my life wondering what if. Yeah. I thought that was honoring to the Amish there. You didn't go too too wild on that. I didn't go wild. The, um, yeah, so. Oh, you did a still? A, yeah, a yeah, yeah. That one's, that one's fun. It's kind of gritty. For uh, flagship media here in Hampton oh, Roads. Yeah. A new day begins. To pick up flagship shot a commercial in my house for Christmas for uh, Blackwater or Black, not Blackwater, Blackhawk. Oh, yeah. Tactical. It was pretty cool. Did you do that horse sound at the top yourself, Dave? Um, no, I think I found this it. Is I found it. Way. What did you pick up on there, Jake? The horse. The <laughs> that was that was not the actual horse making that sound. That was you. no, no, no. That was we, an audio we, file. Yeah, we, we I downloaded the sound effects and added where we it. left off. So, um, so anyways. what do you start with? So they send you this raw audio. I mean, a uh, video file, right? And you you look at it for the first time. Tell us. Tell us how the magic. I, 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 that's where I'm gifted. Like I kind of hear it almost right away, so I, I see it and I start like. But a lot of times there's a brief. Um, so I do a lot of music for Microsoft as well. Like I do a ton. I picked Microsoft up as a client in 2000, and when I say we've probably done since 2000, maybe like 150 jobs. Like music. wow, yeah. Um, do you ever probably, run into um, at Microsoft? Uh, do you do anything with Xbox? No, it's weird. So I'm in the video game industry on that side, but for Microsoft, I do uh, mainly corporate okay. things like Teams. You know and, who's there um, on the Xbox side, pretty high up? Well, Danny Delisle, you talking about? Uh, Danny Delisle's on the micro, uh, Microsoft, one other but division. he's at a different company now. But um, Greg Holman. Really? Yeah, he's at Xbox. Oh, my God. And been there up. for years. Yeah, you should. I talk to yeah. him every once in a while on social He's a good media. guy. Yeah. Great basketball player. Yeah. The um 
Yeah, and his brother Tom. Tom. Yeah. Tom was a set designer guy, right? He, yeah, he, he built did. sets, or yeah, he, still does, I think. <laughs> the, um, <coughs> excuse the, me. The, uh, so to answer your question, I kind of uh, sometimes there's a brief we talked beforehand about what uh, if there's a director like this yeah. thing I'm doing from um, Microsoft right now. There's a director and director has a vision for the music, and so I'm like, okay, cool, and then they'll send me samples of things that inspire them and things they like, and and then I'll you have use to that send them to like option up. one, option two, option three. Or for Nin- you... Nintendo, I do that. Um, okay. I do that for Microsoft as well, uh, depending on the job, depending on how it iterates. So, um, now, is it anything like the music business where if that keeps playing out in the public, you get points on it or you get there's royalties? A way to, there's a way to gather royalties, but the way I work it with my client, I don't... I mean, like, the stuff I'm doing with Nintendo has such a reach that I'm not going to try to claim... I'm not going to claim those... Um, and, and also just honoring to them if they are already claiming them, it's, it's different than music, uh, on air. It's probably somebody out there going like, oh, you're an idiot. You should do it. But I really, I, I have such a good relationship with my clients. They trust me in such a way. And, and interesting enough, this really weird niche of music that I'm in is, um, you can sustain a, a good living doing it. Yeah. And in music, you really, it's insanely difficult to, like, so on the music side of things, artist, producer, all that side, that side is so hard to make music uh, money in right now. And I'm able to have a career writing music full time, which is rare. Are you still getting your royalty checks from um, Velocity Media Group with our production of Graffiti Gray? Um, you should be getting thousands. I, on Graffiti thousands. Gray, I wasn't a writer on that. I was just producing. I didn't get any points. No, oh, I own all the rights to that. You I have the pub- you have the publishing. Yeah. Oh, well, good I on you. Th- <laughs> but you you should be getting a check on that. I didn't write. I didn't. You're no. messing with me right now. <laughs> <laughs> he has such a tell. <laughs> <laughs> Your lip. lip. Can't don't be. don't smile. Don't smile. <laughs> I'm like no way. No, I didn't. I wasn't a writer on that. So I was just producing them. Um, but. <laughs> so going back to making You're looking money, at me like, what? No, I mean, it would it makes sense if you had the publishing on that because you were funding it. Yeah, I do I mean, have it. I mean, but I I gave it. Dave called me years ago and then was like, hey, can I have that back? I want to take it. Just do whatever you want with it. I don't care. It's, I am, I am insanely fortunate to be able to write music for a living. And I actually really enjoy doing these short 90 seconds to minute 30 second things yeah. like... Maybe it's the ADHD in me. I, I love just hyper focusing. Long form stuff sometimes gets a bit arduous. Like it's like, oh man, this is a lot of music for. It's interesting you say that because I've I've talked to Serban in the past about this. Is that if you have a three minute, three and a half minute song, he the mixer could have twelve hours in that song. Yeah, for three, for three and a half minutes. Yeah, which is mind blowing. And that's that about, dude's doing right. about seventy five mixes a month. Which is crazy. That that time math isn't mathing, but he has also a guy. When you he, say he, he has well, a, his, his he's got team. a team now. Yeah, yeah, a team that tees it up, like gets does all the the heavy lifting yeah. to get it to a place where he can just kind of. We well, you know when the math is crazy. That dude is the hardest working person I know in the music business in terms of a person who religiously gets up, yep. has a routine, and after his evening routine of kissing the wife and putting her to bed, he goes back to the studio. Really? Yeah. Well, he does an he evening still, shift? He still does midnights and does, because he's such a perfectionist of getting, it's it's almost an illness or sickness, sir. I'm just, I mean, you know. sir, ben, if you're watching this. Yes. There is therapy for that. It, yeah. I, I mean, it, well. I kid you not. I mean, Okay, this, so I, I get that in the sense of, like, especially living through 2008 and you being in the freelance world, you just say yes to everything. Yeah. And you until and you say yes to everything. I mean, even like I have flexibility within my days, but like going on vacation can be very stressful because I'm like, well, if something comes up in my client, I mean, I've been on Florida vacations 
And I had to bring my speakers down and set up in the Airbnb. <laughs> and uh, I mean, I just took my son to Japan, and I'm in. He's asleep next to me. I'm on my laptop writing music. Wow. In the bed in Japan because we're on the flip time zone. How was that trip, by the way? Oh, Japan's amazing. It looked really cool. Japan. Um, what were the people like? The best. So being a person of faith and, and, and following Jesus and Christianity, I Japan is the most Christian nation that's not Christian. Mm. Bar none. It's clean. Just in their character and their... They're just They think about moral. other people. Yeah. They're helpful to a point where you feel uncomfortable on how helpful they're being. You're like, you ask somebody help for something, and then they're so over and beyond helpful, you feel guilty. Um, and clean, safe, quiet... I mean, it's the most populated city in the world, yeah. and it it's like a park. It, you come outside, you don't. There's no honking, no honking horns. People are quiet. If you're on the subway, you are not to ever talking on the phone. You can be on your phone, but you're not talking. You don't have the audio up or anything. It's so respectful. Um, just I have such an appreciation, and and so working at Tascam was a Japanese-run company, mm-hmm. and I had I I just felt this connection to the Japanese people is how honoring they were. And then going to their country, I'm like, oh, I get it. Like, this is, um, like, if if we weren't doing, uh, like, it'd be, it, I could live there for real. Like, uh, my son David l- loved it. The subway system is so on time, and the Apple app is incredible, like, go to this platform, wait for this train, get on this, get off at this stop. Like it just, you can, you can navigate through Tokyo, no <clears> problem. <throat> and, and then if you ever get, it, you can't do something, somebody's always there to help and loving to use English. Like they love to speak English. Wow. Yeah, I loved it. Isn't anyway. it crazy that that nation is as kind to us after what we did in World War II and you yeah. know, annihilating two cities? Yeah. That they're like, you know what? We we forgive you. Well, it's also we, I, I I'm and of course, of course I can't speak for the Japanese, but there's a whole point of the fact of because of the the warrior mentality in the sense that that we beat them, that they honor the person that beat them and have yeah. a respect for the people that beat them. And I'm beating such a strong word. We just. We were very fortunate to have the technology they would add and what, whether yeah. people are debating whether we should have dropped those bombs or not. I just know that knowing knowing how the Japanese culture, it would have been invading invading Japan would, I think it, everybody would have fought. Like, I, I, I don't... Did you watch Oppenheimer? Yeah, yeah. Talk about a movie that was scored well. Oh, yeah. The music that yeah. went with that. And, and it was... Very impactful movie for me in terms of the politics behind, um, you know, yeah. whether Truman or not should have pulled the trigger on yeah. I, making I, that happen. I, I'm just so thankful I would never have to make a, a, yeah. a decision like that. Right. I could, I'm, and I'm not judging either way. I just I just know getting back to the Japanese culture, well, and sometimes it was about forgiveness is that they are, th- their culture was saying like, oh, you won? Well, now you get the honor yeah. that you deserve. And then um, uh, MacArthur went in there, and then and he had such a passion for the Japanese people because they were so yeah. honoring to him. And yeah. he was like, I, I need to rebuild. I'm going to teach yeah. them everything. And they ran with it. I mean, I remember as a kid growing up and like Japanese products were like, oh, what? and then Japanese cars, and then took off is because they have yeah, pride you in your what MR2. They build. Yeah. You. Yeah. <laughs> My MR2. <laughs> that was a slick car though. I love that MR2. It was, it was so, bad. Yeah, I got hit. Yeah. It was a hit and run. The guy hit me in it. Jeez. In a van too. But it was so light it slid. Like it, it didn't hold to the ground. So yeah. it, it the impact wasn't as bad. ADHD people. Yeah, this is like <laughs> just go everywhere with it. Who cares? Yeah. This is, this is my show and your yeah. show. You you get to say where it goes. Yeah. So what else you want to talk about? Oh, I mean, I don't. You know, if you're if you, you, going back to the entrepreneur spirit, um, work ethic, client services, client services. I mean, I am I have talent, but there are plenty of people that are more talent than I am. Um, but my client services is bar none. Like it, it, 
It is. And what do you mean by that? Um, I'll just do it until they're happy. I, I will. I will do multiple versions. I will. Um, my goal is to have the client, the person who's paying me money to write music, to be happy with what I give them. And um, and it, normally it's not outrageous. Sometimes you go down a, a lane. I I have an interesting relationship with um, so my clients. I work for motion graphic companies that work for the companies, right? So um, sometimes I deal with Microsoft directly. Uh, we'll be on a phone call about music, or and um, sometimes with Nintendo dir- directly. But I'm working through the companies doing the motion graphics for these things. So sometimes you're pleasing the motion gra- graphics company and then the client hears it and they have a different idea. Normally that's worked out beforehand. That rarely happens where the client pivots completely. But sometimes you're, you're I think it's like you're shooting through a window to get to, you know, to get to the tar- actual target. And the window is, is you know, the my direct client. And then, uh, but... But they're the ones providing you the work and you being able to pivot and if something has something in their head that they want and you be able to provide it, that's where they're happy. Um, and and Do you do that from a firm fixed price or do you give – are there change fix. orders where if they go – um, if They're project, so demanding that you – Well, project creep happens very rarely. I build in – I build it into the price that even like months later you want a little change or something that it's there. I build that in the price. Sometimes, um, I, I we, I it's interesting. I've had to adjust the price on one of my clients because they got way more organized. They used to come to me with like three weeks left to delivery and say, "Okay, here it is. Score it. Boom." So like three weeks turnaround, and then they hired a very organized person who is like three months ahead. Right. Well, that what that means is I'm having way more touch points on this project, and so yeah. it's really taking up more hours than it has before. So I've had to adjust based on that. Um, but I usually build it in where it's just turnkey because I'm thinking about my client where they got their budget line, and and if they can have a hard fixed price and know that's not going to get away from them, it it is something they don't even have to think about. Yeah. It's like okay, that's it, and he'll get it done. Boom, and it it is a good price. Like in in compared to the music business side of things, <laughs> it's really good. Yeah. Um. So I'm I'm happy to be doing what I do. I also live in Hampton Roads. I don't live in L.A. anymore, so my overhead is a lot less. I live in a very nice house, but that house in L.A. would be outrageous. Like three would, million, four million dollar house. Literally, it's yeah. just it's not. It's, yeah. it's it's crazy. So I have lived very comfortably in a in a nice neighborhood. My kids were going to private school for a while. They ended up deciding to go to public school, um, and. Uh, you know, my wife works for her own nonprofit that doesn't she doesn't take a salary, so she's able to do that. So shout out Seashore shout out. College, <laughs> Sea Point, Sea Point, Sea Point College. <laughs> All right, Sarah, <laughs> Doctor Hummel. <laughs> yes, she has her yeah. doctorate. She's yeah. She you could you could have her on one day. I will. I guess. Yeah. yeah, she's definitely love to. Yeah. She's way smarter than me. And I won't say Seashore. No, that was our church. Yeah, because right, so I I, I get, completely get it. It is. <laughs> It is an honest Freudian mistake there that I made. So. I don't know if you bring Freud into it, but but yeah, well, <laughs> I'm always thinking of n- naked things and somehow making it sexual. I don't know. I just <laughs> love the fact that I was I'm, <laughs> that I always worried about what I was saying. The fact that you're worse than me is makes it so so nice. <laughs> At 54, I just don't give a shit anymore. It I'm just, just like <laughs> Jacob. He just. Cringes back there sometimes at the stupid stuff that comes can, out of my mouth. I and can I can understand. You know, it, it, that's what I, that's what I love about Jacob is that it, like you guys are wired so so differently, and and as my son David and I are are wired differently, <clears throat> you know. So he he will do the same thing. Yeah. Like, oh, dad, what are you doing? Yeah. And so, well, you know what, Jake? Now, like when I go to a restaurant and we go to have breakfast somewhere. What he has found is that he's the apple doesn't fall far from the tree, I think is the expression. Okay. So the waitress will come over and go, um, would you like any more coffee? And I go, yeah, you can warm it up. 
And he's like, oh, I hate. And he said, <laughs> well, now waitress will come over to Jake and go, would you like some more coffee? And he'll go, yeah, you can warm it up. And I'm like, like what, what's wrong with asking her to warm the coffee up? I mean, right. what, what is that, Jake? What, what is it about that that just hurts you so much? I don't know. It's just a JPism that, that gets me. <laughs> It's weird stuff. Do you have any Davisms that your kids are like? I, oh my you know, gosh. I'm sitting here thinking of them. I'm sure I'll find one. First thing that came to mind was when he told me that sometimes you just have to eat a shit sandwich. But oh my gosh, yes. da- Dave Hummel says it, or I yeah, say that. Dave said that. To I me. say that. Which yeah. he's right. Yeah. Um, oh, make it. Yeah, eating a crab sandwich. I I actually, I I am on the fence about that. So I used to be wholeheartedly believe. That in order to be successful, you have to endure um, a crap sandwich. You have to just like, okay, this is what you're dealt, but you have to persevere through it. Yeah. But I've also been seen that some people are in situations where they need to get out. <laughs> 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 and so that's where, like, on that quote, I am. Um, it's a good, like, on a work ethic, you know, it's like, okay, is this right? Is this fair? No, it isn't. But um, I've just been given real big opportunities because I've been able to endure pretty tough situations when it comes to even talking about client services, things like right. that, right? So there's that. But there's also people that will take advantage and keep serving you crab sandwiches, Um and because they'll know you eat, you'll eat them. Yeah. And and when they have the ability to serve you something good, so that's where I'm, you know. So back to this client service piece and entrepreneurship. Mm-hmm. When you're serving your client so well, do you see a benefit to that beyond the client? Do they see the benefit of the value that you bring? And that, have you ever had a client go, Dave? Man, you, you're so good at what you do. We want to share your name with. Uh, all the time. So referrals are a big part of your business? All the time. Uh, everything that I do is based on referrals and relationships. That's awesome. Relationships. Um, it's a trust thing, right? So let's say you're a producer and you're in charge of doing an open for a TV show or like a big event um, that requires music and all this stuff. And there's so many things you have to worry about. If you know you can give something and put it on somebody's plate and not have to worry about it, your life is so much easier. And that's really the essence of client services, right? Yeah. So I'm sure in your world that people, there's people who are like, you know, I'm good at making the money, but as far as managing where it goes, I don't want to have to think about it. It's arduous. I actually have a personal bookkeeper because just it was just causing me stress to having paying bills and stuff like yeah. that. So I hire somebody who pays pays all our bills. Yeah. And and she pays for herself just in that aspect. So your clients don't have to think about it, and they trust and you have success in what you're yeah. doing, and now now they can go on vacation, or now they yeah. can have take the weight off of um, off of their brain. So yeah. that's, in essence, client services. How can I take the weight off you so you don't have to worry about this? And so that's good. on the creative side of things, sometimes creatives can be very needy and um, and... You know, I don't want to do that. I don't think it should be that way. And at the end of the day, if somebody's paying me money, I'll, I will give them the best product they will allow me to give them. But at, if they want to make such changes that it's not, you know, it just won't go on my website. And it, like, <laughs> it won't, yeah. you know, it'll just be something like, okay, we did that, and you were happy, and you're going to come back to me again, and it's great, and it wasn't as good as I thought it was going to be. But music's so subjective anyways. It's like, right. but, you know, I hear stuff all the time. It's like, wow, that's... I would not have made those choices, but people like it. Oh, that's that's fine. Yeah. Yeah. And outside of um, client services in your world, what what would you say is equally important or um, what what is the value proposition that when clients are measuring uh, you and what you do, is there something that sticks out in your mind? I'm I'm fun to work with. I'm, I'm I'm fun to work with. Like I'm always um, like if we're on you know Zoom calls or whatever. I'm uh, you know always making light and having fun, and being flexible, and and 
I always look at myself, even though I might be freelancing like at a company, as I'm part of the team. In fact, I'm flying. I'm flying in LA in two weeks just to go to a dinner because the rest of the company is going to be in LA. That spread across the country. The rest of them, and they're like, "You should come to dinner." I'm like, "Okay, I will." Oh, and, I'm, and I'm flying in on Saturday, flying in on Sunday, just to go to this dinner. From you know, it's a, a big client, but also we're friends, and yeah. and uh, and and I actually I've helped clients um, with uh, actually uh, Dr. Hummel, my wife, consults for one of my clients uh, because she has her doctorate in strategic leadership. And That's she cool. c- consults with them and organizing their company, and and they love her. And so it started off with conversations with, with one of the owners, just with the um, overwhelming. And actually, this is kind of ties into what I want to get to, and with the servant conversation, is it's working so many hours and it really not having margin to. I mean, family is first, like. I mean, is different because he's empty nester right now. It's maybe a different scenario, but maybe grandkids on the future, right? Mm-hmm. But you got to create margin to be with your family, and um, and also being I'm a procrastinator, so I put margin in for procrastination. Like I don't book myself hard. I give myself, you know, just oh, I got, I just need to take a walk, or I, I want to. My procrastination is usually doing something at the house, like I'm going to do dishes now, or I'll mow the lawn, or I'll do this, like just to get my head out of the project and and be able to bounce around. That seems to be a trend with a lot of creatives. Those procrastination seems to be, and I don't think it's a bad thing. I, I think it's part of artistic expression where you need time, whether you've you're it's up here or it's just in your soul, kind of percolating. Yeah. It, it needs to be there to give you the opportunity to put out a masterpiece. Yeah, and, <clears throat> I, and some, but sometimes I do my best work under extreme pressure, mm-hmm. extreme pressure. Like, hey, we have three hours, we need something. Like, it gets nuts like that sometimes. Does like, every piece you send out have, like, uh, the Dave seal of approval on it, or does some stuff go out with, like, uh, I, I sent that out, but that wasn't my best work? No, that's a great question. Um, and this goes back to watching Pharrell and Timberland and Missy work so fast. I feel it, and I do what I feel, uh, and I like it. Hmm. I don't ever send out something I don't like. I might not like it as much as a version I did before. Like, they'll have me do changes or whatever. It's like, eh, it's not as good. At the other The other version was actually better, but I... You know, it might be scary because it's a little more edgy or whatever. Whatever objection they had to or the changes they wanted made, I might not agree with, but I don't send it out if I don't like it. Um, and I do well under pressure, but I don't like to keep myself – I don't want to have to rely on that. Like, yeah. I, those moments I want to keep from happening. And so I, um, I set deadlines that actually can deliver ahead of time. I'll put a deadline like, okay, mm-hmm. and I'll manage my time. So I, it's the Scotty principle. It's like, Captain, it's going to take eight hours, and he <laughs> does it in four, and he looks like a hero, right? I mean, it's not quite that bad, but I always like to deliver things a little early. If I say end of day on a day, sometimes it's that morning. Is right? there ever a point where you're like, the Q word comes up, quit, where you're like, fuck this, man. I don't, I don't want to do this work anymore. Um, yeah, and I slap myself. <laughs> Like I slept myself real like, quick, right? Yeah, yeah. Like I mean, I get. I'm very thankful. I mean, I mean all the way back to the tenth grader. You know, you and I met in ninth grade. Yeah. And I just think about that in Dave. I'm like, I can't picture Dave doing anything but music. Yeah. I'm very. But there, there were periods where you had to be a chameleon and and shift and picked up to support sets. your family. To it picked up skill sets that actually turned into value later. Yeah. Like that's good. I mean, that's the thing. It's, it's uh, you. S- I. I mean, I say yes to pretty much everything until like unless I don't have the actual time to do it. Um, even when people come to me with and they don't have a big budget and and 
and but they're a new person. I'm like, oh yeah, I'll do this for you for this. And then when you get the and I think they're talented enough that they're gonna get more work. I'll say I'll say yes to it because to me it's just it's an yeah, investment in the future. An, right? Investment. Yeah. All my clients I mean the 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 people I do Nintendo for, I scored their first reel for free. And that's what I tell people all the time. Like, do it for free and prove yourself and then and then you can start charging and the so with that in mind right if you could look 10 years into the future and tell us what your industry is going to look like people are really scared of ai and actually i use ai um but meaning they, pro, like taking over as a mixer or taking over as an engineer or yeah, as a producer or 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 like creating <clears throat> music like you can type in write a country song about waffles and then all of a sudden you have one right <laughs> yeah. um the legalities are really muddy about that but also it's not in a place <coughs> ai is not in a place where you um can direct it very well like it it hmm. it doesn't come to its output the same way a creative person does. It's kind of very outside in and it creates this thing instead of like a linear process. So you can't like take pieces out and stuff like that. And like, um, so I use AI things. I used a uh, project uh, for Microsoft where I had AI vocals. I sang the vocals and it replaced my voice with somebody who sounds much better than me. Really? Yeah. So I can sing enough for a demo. Jacob's heard many of my terrible demos, right? <laughs> um, Any demo I do now, I refuse to put vocals on it because of the Dave Hummel demo vocals I've heard. <laughs> That's why. That's funny. It's I so I did sing in chorus with Dave. Yes, I, yes. you were you were a good tenor. I was right? a baritone. I was decent. Right? So, yeah. I was decent. He holds a note. I can hold a note. Yeah. yeah, and and so I sang the. I, but I had to sing all the parts. So the, it was this uh, kind of Euro like Euro Afro pop thing I was doing and I sang the parts and, or, and did the parts and then the person didn't have a British accent. So I, I got the voice who was a British person, but then they didn't have a British accent and realized, <laughs> Oh, I have to be the British accent. So I had to redo all the vocals with a British accent. And oh then, my God. and then I'd love to hear the raw files of that. Um, and then, uh, and then it worked out like amazingly. And, 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 uh, it was just really funny. I mean, this AI, I forget what his artist AI, I think it maybe is. Or that's a that's a sound thing. Anyways, I use AI all the time to do bits and pieces, bass lines, this, mm -hmm. that, but then I'm taking and I'm rearranging stuff. But people have been doing that with sampling. It's almost the same type of concept. So AI maybe t taking over not taking over. People always need to direct it. Um yeah, and, and I mean, in music in 10 years, it's, I'm actually, we're, I'm working on a musical right now. I can't go into the details, but um, yeah, I'm working on a musical, like a live event musical piece that um, is AI industry proof in a sense, because people are going to show up and watch a live show. Yeah. So um, the other side of that question. Yeah. If you go back 20 years. Okay. Man, you're not old. Maybe even 30 years. Okay. Biggest change and in influence in your career from a, from a music, uh, from technology to what, what, what was the biggest influence in your career? Strangely enough, um, it's another friend of ours, Steve Graham. Steve. Steve Graham, Party Time Karaoke. Super so nice human the, being. Too. This guy. So, so if you watch the um, Poker Face Lady Gaga video, that's one of his houses in Malibu. Steve right? Steve is awesome. Man. Yeah. He's... So he has uh, a company, Party Time Karaoke. So when you go to a karaoke thing and you think, oh, they just removed the vocals out of this, the actual track. No, Steve recreated all the tracks. So I walk in his studio. And he was recreating all these songs. And it was like a studio I'd never seen before. It was all computer-based. Like, he had things to record, but it was completely different wow. in the box with computers. And Can so you he, tell the story about the karaoke part of Steve, too, which is pretty cool? Yeah, you know, so, so this this he has this huge company. He's from Philly. Um, he's very and they were a cover band, right? 
I mean, his I think I don't know. About, yeah, they would they would do cover bands, but then he got really good at recreating these. And the the music business side of karaoke music is legally you need to get the publishing rights from the record company and the writers to order to put out a karaoke version of a song. He was doing that where no one else was. So then he was paying all these legal fees to try to fight other companies that were releasing the same songs. And then finally Universal Music Group made a deal with him. And then he, um, to, to kind of take on that because they realized they were protecting their own interests. Right. And so he was super, is super, super successful in Los Angeles and, but would not tell because he was embarrassed that he was doing karaoke music. So he'd be at Malibu parties with, you know, yeah. um, David Foster and, and Rick, you know, Rick Rubin lives down the street. Garcia. And all, this, and, and all, and all guys, these guys. Yeah. And, and he would not tell them what he did for a living. And I'm like, dude, are you kidding me? Like, this is, but it, it, it's very, it's weird how some people don't, like, embrace it. Now, I, I don't know if he's, he's still there. I saw him maybe four years ago. Randomly, just yeah. so for those who don't know, he owns another house in Malibu. You know where um, Point uh, Doom, Tony Stark's house is yeah. in the Marvel movies. That's actually a park where that is across the street. The only house on the point is Steve Graham's Steve house. Steve Graham's house. <laughs> it's like he yeah. let he let myself and our family stay there oh, over wow. Christmas. I think it was two thousand. Do you remember Jake? Two thousand eight. His home in Point Doom. Yeah. Such a kind dude, and we left him a a, a decent tip. It probably wasn't enough to yeah. let us stay for a week. They shot the house. movie Surfer Dude. Surfer Dude, Matthew yeah. McConaughey. They they shot that in that house. This house. Yeah. But you're exactly right. You walk across the street. The park is Point Doom. You just walk down this little yeah. hill in Pacific Ocean with all the sea lions and everything. Well, did you see when you saw Tony Stark's house in the Marvel yeah. movies? You recognize where it was? Yeah, yeah. It's right there. So right. Steve's house is right uh, there on the left. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's Steve's. It's... Steve's uh, one of his houses. It is crazy. Yeah, yeah. One of his houses. There's one around the corner, which is the studio house at Zuma Beach. Yeah, but um, such a nice human being. You you would never know the guy was uber wealthy. Yeah, and he just you know, and and maybe part of it's like what you were just saying. But you were telling me that the big change seeing his studio, seeing his studio, and realizing, oh man, you can do this in the box. And so I really really started investing in software that were great sample packs and things like that and and orchestral like um, I do big orchestral pieces and if the client has budget to record real strings I will do that right but all these movie scores that you hear that have real strings in it they do that a lot of it for show they're using both they're using yeah a combination because they're playing against like an overlay. Of, yeah, yeah, because sometimes the articulation that was pre-recorded on the sample pack that you have is better than the players that show up and play it, and 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 you get kind of married in your mind to the way that sounds. And so very fortunate. So I started investing more in software packages and all that. And he he was the guy who inspired me to do Interesting. it. Interesting. Yeah. And now, and Serban mixes all out in the right. on the box too. Like I saw, first time I saw Serban at um, the record plant in LA, huge SSL console. He's got two tracks up, two channels up because he's using his his Pro Tools rig. Right. And I'm like, oh, this is this is a paradigm shift, you know. Um, there's actually a really uh, so not that you don't need studios. Um, but also, these are people who have a background in recording. Yeah. So a lot of people buy the gear, and they're like, why doesn't my stuff sound good? But well, you you haven't learned how to engineer. Because you suck. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's just a lot to train your ear and how to, how to do it. There's a great studio here in town, uh, Bay Cloud. Uh, another uh, former intern of mine, Stuart McLeod. And it Stuart, got it, shout out to Stuart. Yeah. And Alan Bays. Um, Jake went to high school with Stuart. Yes, um, yeah. yeah, Stuart. They, they, they've changed the model of a studio to uh, they're producing with you. So you're like paying for the studio, but you're also paying for their expertise. So they're helping make your song better. So that kind of hybrid model, I think, is actually a future of studios where hmm. before you would just you'd you'd book the studio and have an engineer, but you'd have to walk in with the producer and all that, and right. they're kind of combining it all. Yeah, which is, and they do amazing, amazing work. That's really cool. 
um, two great guys, too, Stuart and, Alan. you know, Al, Al, his dad, Marshall, and oh, I, I played know. basketball together for years. Oh, I had no idea. Yeah. yeah. Marshall, he, baby, everybody was baby. Hey, baby. <laughs> really? <laughs> he, was, he was a good ball player, too. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah, s- super great guys. They're really involved in Seapoint College as well. Are they? Yeah, Alan's. Are you guys doing that class together that you're teaching? Yeah, they're, um, yeah, and and we're working on uh, we're working on something that we can't probably solidify or talk about publicly yet, but Sweet. working on something fun. So, fun. Yeah. so um, that kind of leads me into the final question: like, what what's the big thing? What's next for Dave? What are you reading? For talking to other entrepreneurs out there, what encouraging word can you? Pass on to us. Oh gosh, what am I reading? I'm, I mean, I'm reading a lot, a uh, lot more. Well, there's a leadership Green anxiety book. Ham. Leadership anxiety book. Um, you just let that one go. Green, Green eggs and ham. Yeah, <laughs> uh, you know, it's the dad joke. We're both dads, so uh, maybe that's a grandpa joke. Yeah, we're grandpa. I, am. Um, I actually, you know, I just re re. When I say read, I, I listen to books because, you know, th- dyslexia yeah. is not a great thing. But it's, <laughs> I just, you know, I listen to them. I just re-listened to The Shack because I was hanging out with Paul Young, the author. No kidding. Yeah, in Seattle. Just um, hanging out, like, chilling. Well, we had, it was about 15 of us, and it was like a, uh, my uh, Did you friend, go see Derek Holzer? Derek right. Holzer, yeah. Derek yeah. Holzer invited me to this thing. He had Paul Young and... Um, no kidding. And Bradley Jerzak, another author. Shout out to Big D, Big Derek. <laughs> um, and it was like, you know, 15 of us, and it was really, really transformative. So more on the spirit. How so? We're well, more on the spirit. Well, um, all right, well, I'm going to get you religious. Can't, you can't, yeah, man, okay, you can't I'll get say it was really transformative. Okay, Just here leave we go. us with that. Here we go. So I'm a follower of Jesus. And... And Jesus is like, Dave, will you stop following me Not around? Jesus, did Jesus. <laughs> but I like, you know, there's many Jesuses I like. Um, so it's an identifier thing in a sense that it's more participant. You have to, it's not just like you get the badge, you get to wear it, walk around and say, I'm yeah. a Christian, right? So more like I'm continuing to follow, trying to follow in the steps of Jesus. Yeah. So the idea of um, the tree of knowledge and the tree of life in the Genesis story where we chose the tree of knowledge, right? And, and in a way, we are still doing that, where um, people get very focused on, that's why there's all these denominations of churches, because they disagree on the knowledge part, right? But if you look in the Gospels, Jesus was all about relationship first, and then when he was ever pinned down about a question about Scripture, he would bring in Scripture in deep biblical knowledge, but it was first about relationship, and second, then you bring in the knowledge. And so I think we're all very, very divided because we're trying to uh, put knowledge, so Scripture, in front of relationship, Hmm. right? And so this paradigm shift in my mind of, like, first love someone, you don't have to debate of what whether you're affirming or like you're just affirming them being a human being first of all yeah. that's created in the image of God as we all were. And if Jesus said when you treated the least of these you so treated me, well where does that least line start? Well it, maybe it's nowhere. Maybe it's not just the least, maybe it's everyone, right? Mm. It's everyone in the image of God. So you first meet people where they are, love them. And then if they have a question about Scripture or whatever, you can use that to reinforce the relationship that you have, but relationship first. So in my Christian walk, that's been, that's life-transforming in a sense of like, I don't have to get into any, I don't have to, I, I don't have to sit there and like, well, this person believes this or this, it doesn't matter, I, I got to love them where they are, and then use the word to to support an actual relationship. Mm. Yeah. So so that's the transformation is yeah. it, wh- where were you before that? What, what I, I think it was I, I was trying to rectify things in my mind about policy and um, scriptural doctrine doctrine about how I should interface with people because 
the the religion of religion. The religion, yeah. yeah. The religious part of it. it. In thinking that I wasn't a religious person, but realized how religious I was. Mm. Um, that, that that's pretty profound, right there. I think all of us could be guilty of that. Yeah. Anything no. that divides the the enemy wants to keep us separated, wants to isolate, and um, I mean, just the fact that there's so many denominations. And like churches right across the street from each other, you know, it's like because of some. Oh, well, why is there this? Why is there this? Oh, they split on this thing, right? Mm-hmm. Well, relationship first, and and also so much about taking care of the community and and. You know. So I'm going to go there. Okay. F- politically. Okay. Do you think that's what's missing in? Our, our politics in America today is that there, you know, we could go back. I remember when your dad was the Republican of the, uh, uh, or he was the second, chairman. Yeah, second district chairman. Chairman of the yeah. Republican Party. Um, and your dad had amazing influence on my life growing up. Mm-hmm. So shout out to Dave Sr. Yep. Um, great dude. And your mother as well. Um, there, we, there could be many stories Dave could tell there. And that your mom could tell from heaven and how often I raided your fridge. And you are always welcome to raid the fridge. So. <laughs> but, um, you know, I, I, I think about that in the race today, in this very divisive race mm-hmm. that, that's in place. And to me, that's, that's what's missing from both sides is being able to empathize and, and to have one of the things I call it that I learned from a guy named Chris Voss, who was an FBI negotiator, mm-hmm. having tactical empathy. Can I tactically empathize with your position? I want to be empathetic but not sound like a wuss. Yeah. <laughs> I ain't, I ain't it's giving tactical. It. Yeah. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> but in tactical empathy, you're, you're empathizing with an end state in mind. You're you're going, okay, I still want to affirm and hold true to my position, but I need to be able to figure out why Why does Dave believe the way he believes? Well, I would say this, is that, okay, 24-hour news networks. Poison. Poison. <laughs> so they want to sell you medication yeah. and pillows. Yeah. Right? <laughs> That's it. And it's really, really hard to broadcast for 24 hours. Like, it is very, very difficult. Yeah. What do you, you, you have to, you have to find stories. You have right. to, when the news, when we were growing <clears throat> up as kids, was curated, right? Yeah. You had the evening world news, you had the local news, and then you had the world news. It was 30 minutes. And so people had to sit down and say, okay, what is going and to be And they the had news? to think about what they were going to publish oh. because they got one shot at it. Yeah. yeah that's it. And, 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 and so now it's the opposite. Now yeah. it's all about opinions and, and people get on and just espousing opinions, mm. but anything that makes you and the us and them and enemies, like these people that you say the polarization, it's funny because it, the polarization is actually on the fringes. Mm. Most people, right. most people are much closer. And I have been finding that there is a, tribe of people that are in the middle, left and right, that look at the ends and go, well, that I can't, I'm not going there. And um, that's what's going to happen is winning that middle is also going to become... But how do you take someone like you and I, who I would say, and I I know your politics a little bit. I mean, maybe. Uh, I'm pretty... Pretty. We'll have okay. this fucking fight off <laughs> off camera, but um, and people would love to see us go. But I, I would say what you and I fear in our candidates is my dude, and I say that very loosely. Right. Um, turns everybody into a fascist. Your person, the fear I think a lot of people have is they they turn our society into a bunch of communist Marxists. And but that's the fringes, Dave. 
You know it. Well, I mean, the that's idea, what everybody's fearful. But of. that's what that's what one side is saying. Like, oh, it's going to be Mark. I mean, this is the th- so. But when you when get live, Marxism okay, and fascism right, so not, close to each other, they're exactly it's, the same. It's it's different. Like when you say, I mean, when I say, hey, you want to talk to a real Marxist? Like, yeah. so when I moved to Los Angeles, I was very very right wing before I moved to LA. Because I'm like, how can you be a Christian and be a Democrat? (laughs) And then I went to L.A. and realized that the people, my friends, cared about the same thing. They just And they would say, how could you be a Christian and be a Republican? Mm -hmm. I mean, as as seriously as my Republican friends here. And, And I realized that it's a prioritization that most people are priorities, prioritization, but... But fear mongering, right? Um, calling people fascists, calling people Marxists, is how they sell, how they keep you in, scared and engaged in whatever they're feeding you. Yeah. And um, all right, this is my political stance. The left cares about poor people. The right really is not high on their priority list. The left have a very hard time managing things effectively, and the right's really good at managing things. And if they could, if the people on the left and right could come together and and be practical about solving, bringing people in the middle class. You want to stop Marxism? Bring more people to the middle class. That's yeah. it. Marxism. Every Marxist revolution happened because. There was this the, big, super, yeah. uber rich, and most of the people were poor, yeah. and that's how you oligarchs. Keep, yeah, poor, yeah, Got that's it. how you keep Marxist revolutions from happening. I 100 percent agree. Yeah, so you have to bring people in the middle class, and that means not taking the top and bringing them down to the middle class, but bringing the bottom up into the middle class. Yeah, and that and and if if whatever party solves that, right, I think is going to be effective in for this country. The middle class is where, and and most people are are worried about their kids. They're trying to raise their family. Yeah. They're trying to pay bills, and they're trying to make it. So, work. do you solve it with bigger government or smaller government? Like that's going to be. Well, I would say it would be on uh, on uh, nonprofits to solve that, but um, yeah. it's not a pro. It's not a priority for. I mean, there's. If non if nonprofits were doing the job they were of taking care of the poor, the government wouldn't have to. And I'm with yeah. that, but in it, in lieu of that, I believe that needs to be more government interaction into so helping. So 27 years of being in the financial business, mm-hmm. I think one of the biggest, ugliest mistakes for America mm-hmm. was Social Security. Because it was a safety net. And what it did is that it took the power out of NGOs non-governmental organizations. It moved from the church being responsible for the drunkard and the widow and its, or widower's children mm-hmm. to now going big government saying, hey, we, we, we got this. You guys just stay out of the way. We'll, we'll manage this for you. And then both sides, both Democrat and Republican, raped and pillaged that system and then revamped it um, yeah, well, modified I mean, it. I I would say definitely the new the new the rights challenge with the new deal and seeing it as doing that there it is a perspective to look at it. I I would I don't know enough about the time of of how destitute the country was coming out of the Great Depression and what needed to happen. I also know that it happened all along the same times as as us getting into World War II, which may have solved a lot of that because there were jobs in manufacturing. The war machine, yeah. right? Yeah. The industrial yeah, well, war. <laughs> which it has its no. own issues, right? Right. I, I'll say this if it would be controversial, right? People talk about the welfare mom who's having more kids to get more money, but they never talk about the guy who, as you know, is over a military budget and knows if he doesn't spend and shoot Ooh. off every every bullet and right. every missile, he will not get that same money at the same time. It's, it's a problem. I, I mean, I'll call out my industry. It's a what BlackRock is doing is a problem. Yeah. You know what the vanguards of the world are doing. It's a problem, and those aren't easy overnight fixes. 
the, the same as it's not an easy overnight fix to take some controversial issue like abortion mm-hmm. and it, you, you have to get at the heart of a mother and a father to fix abortion. You have to get at the heart of a corporate leader, right? Which is back to that, what you said earlier, the transformation of bringing relationship versus religion, your Man. economic religion, your, your sp- spirit-led religion. Yeah, it it has to come back to relation, like and competitiveness. Like as far as as far as, I mean, it, people sometimes people have money, which I am one, have the tendency to hang out in in groups that make them feel less than and mm. want to keep up with the Joneses mm-hmm. and buy the the next thing and stuff. And, and stuff and vacations and all that. Though vacations have a different thing because the experience with your family can never be. Right. That's that's a value. Yeah. Since 2020, I changed my whole heart on that. Like, yeah. We we travel. Um, but I call it the 401 condo versus the 401k. Would you <laughs> rather hand your kids a 401k statement and say, "Kids, look at this. My S and P 500 stocks here. They've done 23 percent," or pick up the keys to your condo in Florida? And say, kids, hey, how would you like to go spend a yeah. week with me? Right. <laughs> Jake. Hopefully they like you enough. Mind. Right. <laughs> but that that's that comes back to the relationship of the assets versus the the value. The the real value is what the money can do for you and your family. Well, and also your community, right? So yeah. this is where the the demonization of poor people that I I see sometimes on the right about how you know pull yourself up by your uh, your bootstraps or whatever. First of all, you can't do that. It's impossible. It's weird that it's the metaphor. Yeah. <laughs> you cannot pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. Um but uh the idea of not being focused on how do we get people into the middle class training? There are some amazing people on the right that do great things for people. I'm not saying I'm not using a blanket statement and stuff like that, but but a lot of times it's a lot of finger pointing and, and an idea of, oh, they're in this financial state because they weren't wise with their money and they kind of sort of deserve it. And if mm-hmm. they were better with it, well, a lot of times it's education about being exposed. I mean, think about yeah. the, your fina- your education and finances was yeah. before you got into this business and then you got exposed to people who actually knew what they were doing, and it yeah. changed your world, right? right? That's knowledge that people can share. Yeah, I put myself in the Eddie Murphy trading places scenario. <laughs> Two dudes bet a crusty old dollar on me, right? It's strangely the same name. I won't call yeah. out names, but strangely <laughs> the same name. Mortimer and Dukes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Ron Dukes, I, I pay homage to, to Ron all the time for being a, a great mentor and taking a chance on me. Um. And but you hustled. There, you hustled. Yeah. And hustle in a good, not like... Well, the hustle was being smart enough to listen, but actually dumb enough to go do what the mentor said do. But you, not to get into your story, but you had come from a place where you were like, you saw the value of the opportunity, and you're yeah. like, I'm not going to screw this up. Yeah, I grew up poor. I knew what, I knew what poor yeah. looked like now. There's definitions of poor, right? I didn't yeah. know I was poor. Then there are people who know they are they're poor. They're, yeah, yeah, they're, yeah. But I didn't know. I mean, my parents hit it well, mm-hmm. and, and it was because of values, right? And it was the values that they taught. I grew up. I was the opposite. I grew up rich and didn't know it. That's we, were, we were the <laughs> we were the poorest rich people <laughs> in the neighborhood. Like my friends had horses and indoor pools and stuff like that. I'm like. And got every toy for Christmas. I'm like, what? And I had no idea that I was actually... That was Ohio, like the P&G days. Yeah, my dad worked for Procter, Procter & Gamble. Gamble and, and we that satanic in, company that... Oh, my God. What was it? Remember that? First, hey, that's yeah. a whole well, that's why I say uh, the, the right started uh, cancel culture. Uh, cancel culture. Yeah, 100%. Right. Disney, p and G. I I remember all these things. Right. All I don't disagree with any of it. So that, that's the funny thing is that I know Dave. I mean, we've had years of sporadic relationship in our... 30 plus year mm. friendship. But I I know, like when I say I know the politics, I don't give a shit about your politics, right? I know yeah. the human being. Yes, exactly. Right? But, but more people see this as a thing. 
because we. But I grew time. up in the South, and I, I would come in and say words that your mother would be like, "Kenny Porter, you can't, you can't say that word. You can't yeah. say the N word." Yeah, yeah. I didn't know. Yeah, yeah. I grew up in a culture where it wasn't a bad thing. Yeah. And then all of a sudden it was, and I'm like, "Well, shit, sorry." <laughs> I mean, it was. <laughs> she get you on know, your. Can I have some? Bi- <laughs> can I have some biscuits and mustard? You know. Yeah, the uh, well, I mean, I think also people not spending time with well, also because you you spend a lot of time in you know in with white people who yeah. that said that and it right. was okay in the way you grew up, and I think most people not being um, around people if you if if you find yourself at dinner parties always agreeing yeah. with everybody that's around you, you need to be, find some other friends. Right. Not different, like just additional friends, right? right? You need to be in spaces where, and that was when I moved to Los Angeles and I realized, oh, these people really follow Jesus. They, I mean, showing mercy. And if someone's not challenging your values at some point in time, you, you probably are in an echo chamber. I would say... <laughs> um, one of the people, when we lived in L.A. and my wife was going through cancer treatment, one of the most kindest person, selfless person that came and helped take care of her when I had to go work and stuff like that, who in months into it found out she was taking the bus to get to our house. Wow. Right? <clears throat> Marxist. I mean, a real Marxist. Yeah. Not a fake Marxist. A real <laughs> Marxist. Okay? Not... Oh, they're on the left, so they're on the, or or they're just left of me, so they're Marxist. Yeah. No, a real Marxist studied. Right? Marxism. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah, hundred yeah. percent believed that capitalism was evil and all that stuff. Like hundred percent believe it, but showed the love of God in a practical way. Didn't have to. It was someone you're just in the choir with, with Sarah. Like, wow. and so we had some amazing conversations. It opened my eyes to things like okay motivations why I just dis- we disagree on many things on many many things I am not I am not a Marxist but the people that believe like oh capitalism does a lot of you know people you know some corporations just pour raw sewage into a river if they could get away with it yeah. with but this is the thing at the end of the day you take Marxism you take capitalism if you don't have ethical people who are thinking about others in those positions of power any system's evil every system's sure. evil it doesn't work and my dad was he he was one of those kind giving person um, charitable was constantly giving money to people. He was very char. He wouldn't. Fl- he he had a client that was a ministry. He would not fly business class eighteen hours to India, and I'm like, and his legs were busted up. And I'm like, Dad, you need to get them to fly you business class. This is ridiculous. You're in these small yeah. chairs, and your legs are busted up. And 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 I had to just convince him to do it. But he was that conservative. He was like a real conservative mm-hmm. when it comes to. And real conservative it means being. Fisc- fiscally Fiscal, res- yeah, yeah. yeah, responsible. I'm not going to spend this money if I don't have it, right? Yeah. Which now people on the right like to play they are, but they run up deficits anyways, mm-hmm. right? Like, but claim that, right? Um, so we need ethical people and and on all sides. So how, how do you fix it? One on one. You you can't fix. You can't put in institutional things that fix it. Um, the only thing that's fixed is is. Um, so one-on-one Holy Spirit in a moment, what is the Holy Spirit saying to you to, to, to minister to the person you're talking to and, and then trust the ripples. You don't have to, not the drink. No, the, the, the ripples. <laughs> like if you're saying, if you're, if you're helping someone out and you're in, in all that, and then you don't have to own the whole aspect of it. It's just moment by moment and then trust the ripples and then and God works in the ripples. Yeah. God works in the ripples. That's good. I yeah. like that. I think that's a good ending note. Cool. We're talking about a lot. This went it, far afield. That's good. <laughs> I, I lo- that's what I love. That's why it's the black box. Gotcha. Right? gotcha. From oxygen to money, we're going to cover it all. Yeah. And you know, oxygen and money, the only two things in life you can't live without. I mean, you can live without money. All right. There's let me pl- know. Let me know how that works. There's 
pl- well, if if uh, live, live <laughs> one day without any money. No, I'm saying not in the United States. But there's people living in there's people living on islands everywhere without any money. Okay. Money is just money is the is But we said there are two things you can't live without. <laughs> okay. You found, you found there's one. two there's two things you get. You can't live you could you could you could yeah. I would say I would say if you're watching this podcast, there are two things you can't live without. <laughs> right. It's two things. Did what I, he said. Yeah. What did he say? Cool. Let's do this again. I mean, yeah. I'd love to do it and bring Sarah and so we can have a PhD to actually have these real. Oh, dude, you got to have her on by. You got to have her on by. So you can't, we can't be in the same room and have a conversation because yeah, I will. It's like trying to have Kathleen in here with. Yeah, yeah. it would not work. You tell you one on one, she's brilliant. She's brilliant. You, so you're saying you bring her IQ down when you're in the room with her? 100%. Okay. Yeah, yeah 100%. I, no, wait, hold on. 110%. <laughs> The number it's 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 bigger than one hundred percent, but it's huge. <laughs> <laughs> love you, man. I love you too. Great seeing you, brother. All right, thanks. thanks. Black box.